Yeah. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, colleagues, especially also to those who are online. Welcome to the 2023 GAXA Annual Forum. And we know the theme, expanding the global adoption of climate smart agriculture. It is truly a pleasure to see some familiar faces here and soon to become friends of mine here at, at, at the, our meeting today. So my name is Imelda, but please do call me Dada. Um, and I'm co-chair for the Global Alliance for Climate Smart Agriculture. I am joined today by, you know, by everyone knows him, Mr. Hans Hugeven. And we are going very excited to have this full program to finally be able after the pandemic to be with you all together and to discuss this very important topic as climate becomes more and more needed by our countries as countries increase their climate pledges. So now I just wanted to say that it, might, it may look like GAXA has taken a silent turn or has gone into hiatus, but we're actually have some achievements to share. I would like, for example, to mention that the ASEAN Climate Resilience Network, which is a staunch member of the GAXA family, has, for example, addressed this big bottleneck in scaling up CSA through the successful acquisition of the first in the world multi-country sectoral readiness grant from the Green Climate Fund. And so I'm joined by some of our family members from the ASEAN Climate Resilience Network. It's some of our achievement. And over in Europe, there's also, Rosa kindly put my attention towards the development of the European Innovation Partnership which on agriculture, which is now integrated in the EU Common Agriculture Policy Network. And they're doing a lot, especially in promoting 100 living labs across the EU, thanks to the development of the SCAR agroecology. There's more to this, and feel free to talk to Rosa about this. Feel free to talk to the ASEAN Climate Resilience Network about the grant. And this is actually, I mentioned these highlights that we are really not being silent. There's a lot of activities going on. And that's why we're very excited with this, finally, this forum, to be able to exchange information as we go along in the next two days. So I just wanted to mention that for our meeting, this meeting is really framed around GAXA's cross-cutting themes of youth, women, and finance being as inclusive as possible, but highlighting the central role of farmers in our work. And what, what, what can we expect as well in the, in the next two days? We wanted to launch and share new activity proposals that will give us the opportunity to engage more, revitalize our engagement with the Alliance, and to see how we can accelerate these GAXA's multi-stakeholder actions, create new tools, and share knowledge to lead positive change. So those are our objectives of these two days, but we really wanna hear from you and your voices. So we could do this during breaks, during exchanges, after all the great speakers that we have lined up. So before I hand over the floor to Hans, I think there's some housekeeping rules, no? Uh, firstly, uh, that this meeting is being recorded. It's okay, let us know. If not okay, let us know as well. Um, and tomorrow, um, tomorrow we are going to have a translation, um, a French translation tomorrow, right, Hans? And anyone, we, we don't forget our um, members who are online, so please do give all your feedback, your questions um, on the chat box, and we'll make sure to incorporate your comments in, the, in, the, in our discussions. So I think that that is so far my part. And Hans, the floor is yours now. Thank you very much, Dada. And <clears throat> good morning to you all. Great to have you here. And we don't only have you here in the room, but we have already more than 50 people 
in the virtual room. So it's, we, it is a hybrid meeting. So we try to be interactive as possible with the whole world. So I wouldn't say only good morning. It would be good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Great to have you here. And let's make it an exciting two days. Exciting means also interactive, not only listening to, uh, I think, our excellent speakers, but see how we can turn words into action. And that's very much needed because last year we were confronted with the perfect storm of crisis, we all know. And we know, all know that especially the developing countries are hit hardest. And we know the listening figures, 860 million people living in hunger. Every day you read in the papers about climate change, but we don't read in the papers anymore, the 860 million people in hunger. If we don't, if we don't act next year, we go over the 1 billion people living in hunger. It's unbelievable. And on top of this, we know from those almost 1 billion, 345 million people are living at the, at the edge of starvation. So it's all the more reason that we need to act. We have really a severe food crisis. And we know also that there's a huge contrast because we are losing one third of our produced food every year. And let's be honest, we know our challenges. We have made our commitments already in 2015 by stating that in 2030, we have ended hunger. Of course, we know that we are not going to achieve it. But let's be also realistic. We have to increase our efforts to make it happen, to come close to our sustainable development goals. And that means not only dealing with climate change, but we also need to deal with agriculture production. We know that we have to feed around 50 billion people in 2050. And with the current production, it, ne it needs an in intensification of agriculture production in a sustainable way. So we know our commitments. We know how to do it, at least we think how to do it, but we know we cannot do it at the global level. And Bill Clinton said last year at the United Nations General Assembly, if I go to, to speak in rooms, I say, we have our commitments, we know how to do it. And then I ask, how are we going to do it? And he said, then it remains silent in the room. And that's the angle for, I think, also the Alliance for Climate Smart Agriculture in the next coming years, how to make it happen at the national level. And everybody is speaking now about agri-food systems. It's a new buzzword. But let's not forget that our food, <laughs> our food systems start with the farmers. Yesterday, we had a presentation at the meeting of the International Agri-Food Network about the FEO Hand in Hand initiative, a presentation of 15 minutes. In those 50 minutes, the farmers were not mentioned even. And only after 13 minutes, the private sector was mentioned. So there's something fundamentally wrong if you don't put the farmers and the private sector in the middle again. Because if we want to transform our food systems, it has to be done at the national level. And it starts with the farmers. And it starts with the private sector. We have to give the farmers the access to technologies, innovations, so that they can implement climate smart agriculture. We have to bring the private sector on board. And we always speak about funding. They will invest, but we have to make sure that they are sitting around the table. Luckily today, they are sitting around the table so that they really invest in our national food systems. And often we speak about the theory of change. Let's change the theory. Let's change the practice. We have our Alliance for Climate Smart Agriculture. I think we are now nine years since its foundation 2014. The concept has arrived, and everybody knows the concept. We have the awareness. 
Now we have to go into the practice. Next year we have our tenth years of our tenth anniversary, and let that mark the shift to action at the national level. Let's discuss that these two days, and we need you. We need all the constituencies to do so. We have to learn from each other, work with each other, support each other. And that's why we have, an, I hope, an, an interesting program for you these two days, everything in it. But we focus on farmers. We focus on innovation technology. And of course, we focus on the youth. Where are we without the youth? So let's go into the next phase. Let's make it interactive these two days. Just don't sit and listen, but come in whenever you want. Whenever, Whether, whenever wherever. Here in the room, and of course, via your raise hand function, if you are virtually there. And it's now my great honor to announce the first speaker, and everybody knows her. My dear and very good friend, Agnes Kalibata. And of course, everybody knows her as the director of Aqua, but I think she's even more known because she's the special envoy for the World Food System Summit. And it's amazing what she did in the running up to the Food System Summit last year and the Food System Summit itself, because it raised the awareness at the highest level. It made our heads of states and our CEOs and leaders of organization aware of the biggest problems we have. In July, we will have the UN, United Nations Food System Summit stock taking. Where are we one year later? Where are we with implementing results? Are we really involving farmers, private sector in a concrete way? So it's more than a pleasure to give the floor to Agnes Kalabata. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, Your Excellency, for the, those introductory remarks. Uh, I'm really, really happy to be part of the conversation today. And it's really good to see um, old friends around the table, food system friends around the table. Really proud that we are all carrying the torch and taking it forward. Uh, I'm also happy to be part of this conversation, uh, but also to be part of this group. Uh, that is looking at climate smart agriculture and how we can do things differently. I'll not go into the details of the challenges we face today, we know them, but let me just mention one uh, because we really always have to put things in perspective. We just went through a major drought in Kenya and Eastern Africa that left a lot of people dead. And now the rains have come and we are going through a major flood major floods in Rwanda. In fact, this week alone, they lost 130 people in one night, right? And that is happening in many other places. And we know that Mozambique and Malawi still are going through the cyclone that just started recently. So there's no running out from the fact that climate change is actually now doubling down uh, on, on, its, on its velocity and, and how it's going to be impacting people. So for those of us that are sitting in these spaces where we are talking about what, what type of action is needed, it's really, really important that we raise our voices even higher. Yesterday, I actually just took a one day trip to be part of the Pittsburgh meetings that are happening in, in, in Berlin, just because I got the opportunity and I felt like even if I was there for one hour, just to talk about some of these challenges that we go through and the, the level of effort that is needed to invest in communities. You know, this challenge is a global challenge. It's impacting people everywhere. It has an unbelievable local impact, but we cannot leave action to local actors because they don't have capacities. The ones that are being affected the most don't have the ability to deal with this problem. And yet you almost feel like countries that are struggling with debt are left dealing with this challenge. Communities that are struggling with what is going on in their environments are left on their own. And we are coming in, yes, we are coming in with emergency support in many of these places, but sometimes it's a bit too late. 
for some of those communities, it's, it's getting late. So what do we do? Let's just also remember that agriculture is part of the problem, right? That, that the, the food, if there was one thing we learned from the food system was that our food system is also part of the problem, that we actually are contributing 30% to degradation of the agricultural ecosystem itself by degrading uh, biodiversity, but also we are contributing to degradation of the environment. So yes, we are part of the problem, even as we are looking for food, to food systems to continue feeding us and creating the solutions we need. We are, there are many opportunities that are on the ground. My, uh, last week, we had a number of ministers here from Africa travel to Vietnam to look at some of the solutions they've been working on with the World Bank in climate smart agriculture and trying to understand how some of these solutions can be adapted to the African context. So people are actually looking for solutions. Here in Africa, uh, in Kenya, uh, we've been working with the government of Kenya on making regenerative agriculture real, recognizing that again, with highly eroded soils, we need to be rethinking how to rebuild this capacity. And this is beginning to take hold. In Nigeria, uh, agroecology and uh, different practices of agroecology are beginning to give farmers better yields than when we do the traditional agriculture the way we know it. And there I could go on, you know, many of these practices and many of these solutions even better than me. But what I'm trying to say to the point that was made earlier, the tools are there. We know what needs to be done, the tools are there. So I, I think that we need to raise our voices higher. We need to advocate even stronger for these communities that are struggling uh, uh, within agricultural systems that are, are not paying off, but are also highly eroding. Uh, we need to understand that we, we can be part of the solution. And we need to understand that there's a lot of knowledge that we need to share. There's already a lot. I appreciate the work that FAO is doing in moving policies and ensuring that policies that do work in different places are being um, put forward and shared across the 196 countries that, that are members of FAO. But there are also country, like I said earlier, but there are also country opportunities for us to learn from. If you went to Rwanda, you will see how even as they have some of these challenges, how they're working to strengthen uh, their ecosystem so that it is more resilient to climate change. If you went to uh, to, to some of these other countries that, like I mentioned, you would see different solutions that are being put in place. But we have to come back to really the whole idea of do, do these countries have the capability? Can we move faster? And I know uh, some of our colleagues from the World Bank are around this table as well. Can we move faster on financial instruments that you have been talking about and rethinking financial instruments that make it possible for adaptation to work in Africa? and other, other countries, small island states and other countries that are suffering from this? And can we make it possible for communities to get access to more resilient tools and means in the area that we work, strengthening access to drought tolerance, varieties that can offer drought tolerance, varieties that are resistant to flooding, which do exist, ensuring that communities have more access to these, ensuring that businesses are more resilient to the challenges that climate change is, is, is bringing towards us, especially businesses in the agricultural sector. I mean, if you're a business in the landscape, in the livestock landscape in Kenya, you probably haven't worked the last three, four years in some of these places. And that because you haven't worked the last three, four years, you're no longer a business. You probably corrupt as an SME. These SMEs take forever, forever to build, to get to, to stage up, and their, their capital and everything is being eroded by climate change. So financing is going to be very, very critical, and, and adaptation financing is going to be very, very critical. In the meeting yesterday that we were in, it was good to see that the government of Germany stepped forward with the two billion investments in the Green Climate Fund. We hope that many more can, can do this. So that these resources, there are resources that are becoming available to countries, but also we hope that the Green Climate Fund makes it possible and easier for countries to access adaptation financing so that we can invest in climate smart agriculture. So um, I really want to, again, 
Thank you. I want to challenge you that next year, when you talk about the 10th anniversary, let's do it in the field. Let's do it in places where we are actually seeing what is going on in these countries, how these communities are coping, because it's here and they live through it every day. But they've also come up with coping mechanisms that can teach us a lot on how to support them, on how to work with them on the policies, on the investments that are needed, and on the type of, um, of, of tools that we should be evolving to support them even further. So thank you again for having me as part of this conversation. And again, I challenge us to think about raising our voices higher, advocating and keeping these issues in, 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 in everybody's faces, working to ensure that local action is not left to struggling communities and farmers and small island states, and ensuring that financial instruments are becoming available. So thank you again, and uh, over to you, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ektish Karibata, for your great words, for addressing us, and also for your great global work you are doing with Food System Summit as Special Envoy, but also in your role as director, bringing action to the country in Africa where it's needed most, to the farmers. Thank you so much. Now I turn the floor to Martin van Nieuwkoop. He is the Global Director for Agriculture and Food Global Practice of the World Bank. And of course, we all know the, our journey of the Global Alliance of Climate Smart Agriculture started in 2010 with international conferences in The Hague, followed in Vietnam, followed in South Africa. And in 2014, the Global Alliance was born. And the World Bank was one of the two founding fathers, I would say. Uh, I don't have a more general neutral uh, term, but one of the founding fathers of the Global Alliance of uh, Climate Smart Agriculture. And it's great to have you here, Martin. Very good. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Hans, and, and thanks very much I mean, for the opportunity to um, uh, talk about, I mean, the uh, main focus of the uh, annual forum. Uh, so I will be focusing on mainstreaming climate smart agriculture, which I think is very much aligned with the thematic focus of the forum today. So I will talk a little bit, I have a presentation here, thanks for putting it up, on the context uh, that we are in, um, in when it comes to food systems. And of course, uh, we cannot ignore the rising food insecurity. Um, so that sets the stage for the why, uh, the challenges ahead and what needs to be done, uh, the what. Uh, I will also talk about the farmer's perspective, Hans, I think uh, very, very important. And then on the how, you know, I will put actually four enablers that we think at the bank needs to be put in place. I mean, to really, really mainstream climate smart agriculture across the world. I mean, next slide, please. Uh, so in terms of context, and Hans, you already, already uh, you know, mentioned it. I mean, uh, uh, the news on global food and nutrition security uh, globally for continues, I mean, to be very sobering. I mean, I think that came also out very clearly at the launch of the global report on food crisis uh, yesterday. Um, uh, we particularly note, uh, you know, you see this increase, uh, no, no need to provide details there, but we particularly note with very great concern that the gender gap in food security actually has grown eightfold, I mean, since 2018. So it's particularly women and children that are being affected, I mean, by those rising numbers that you see there. Um, of course, um, the other thing is that um, uh, COVID and the war in Ukraine accelerated the increase in food insecurity, but in fact, food insecurity has been increasing since 2015, actually the year, the same year that the SDGs were adopted. And clearly now um, to achieve the SDG 2 by 2030, what is needed now is to reverse the existing trend in the wrong direction and then make up for all the progress that has lost between 2015 and 2023 and use the remaining years i mean to to accelerate progress towards zero hunger in the last update uh, uh, when i spoke at our board, board of directors in the bank that was march 31st we actually said that probably high with a high probability that uh, SDG2 actually would not be um, uh, achieved. Next slide, please. Um, now, 
Yeah, you don't see the entire slide actually because we saw sort of people on the screen. So I don't know where you want to correct that. Um, um, you know, there are actually many drivers of this crisis, uh, which are currently worsening all aspects of uh, food and nutrition security across the globe. I mean, it's not just domestic food price inflation that is causing alarm bells to ring around the world. I mean, including in the developed uh, economies. Um, but there are also many factors that are actually compounding one another and actually entrenching this crisis across the various dimensions of food insecurity, including food access, uh, food availability, food utilization, and food stability, as indicated on the slide. And, and of course, those factors are playing out differently in each country. And that, that means, uh, as Hans was saying, and the action needs to happen at the county level. But at the same time, there are no blueprints. I mean, so actions need to be tailored, I mean, to the specific conditions of the countries. So next slide, please. Um, now, looking forward, um, uh, we see five risks, I mean, that we are particularly concerned about. Um, and uh, uh, we think, I mean, that this compounding impact of those risks uh, might make the global food crisis actually worse before it gets better. Um, the first is the rampant um, uh, domestic food price inflation um, that I already mentioned. Uh, the second risk is the global fertilizer prices. They have come down, but I mean, very uh, big concerns about fertilizer affordability, which is at the lowest levels, I mean, since 2007, 2008. Uh, the third risk is the uh, declining stock, stock to use ratios for the major grains. Um, uh, this means, I mean, that food availability might become more of a constraint probably moving forward. Um, the fourth risk is the depressed uh, production coming out, declining grains and oilseed production in Ukraine. And the fifth is the, um, uh, and a kind of a lot more and more alarming kind of news around, you know, if the El Nino around the corner that actually uh, might actually happen in the fall. Uh, so those five risks, I mean, are all kind of raising red flags. I mean, that things might get worse before they get better. Next slide. Um, now, in response, um, Hans, you were talking about action. Uh, I think the bank, I mean, put the money where its mouth is. I mean, they actually made available $30 billion between last year and May. Um, and we said we would make it available uh, by June 30th, uh, 2023. Actually, we made that available by December 31st, um, uh, 2022. Um, and basically, since, 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 since there are no blueprints, we're basically offering a menu that actually countries can select from. Uh, and those are reflecting the four dimensions of, um, of food security. I mean, the first element is to support production and producers to ensure availability of food. Uh, the second element is to facilitate increase in food and agricultural inputs to ensure the stability of the food system. Uh, the third element is the affordability, uh, making sure that vulnerable households um, uh, are protected through well-targeted and nutrition-sensitive uh, social safety nets. And the fourth element, and, and this is where climate smart agriculture comes in. This is not just a short term, but also see how we can complement the short term with building uh, resilience moving forward uh, so that actually the food systems are better prepared, I mean, to withstand um, the future crisis. Uh, uh, next slide. Um, now, taking a step back a little bit, I mean, uh, uh, the, the bigger picture is that the rising food insecurity that we have seen um for quite some time are actually a reflection i mean that the global food system is not fit for purpose um i mean as this slide indicates you know food systems i can contribute to a healthy economy by being a driver of inclusive growth um food systems can contribute to healthy people and uh, by providing healthy diets um, and those of course are directly linked i mean to the quality of human capital uh, and of course, they also, food systems can also contribute, I mean, to healthy planet uh, by providing nature-based solutions and climate smart agriculture as part of that. Uh, but right now, there's a very big gap, I mean, between what the global food system is supposed to do and the reality on the ground. And for that reason, SSG2 is out of reach um, um, moving, for, um, moving forward to 2030. Next slide, please. Um, now, I, I, many people might already have seen that slide. I mean, this is one of the slides that we use. Where we also work with Agnes in the in the uh, for the UN Food System Summit, where the World Bank was working on the on the finance lever. 
So when we say that the global food system is not fit for purpose, there are many, many hidden costs. I mean, there have been estimates of those hidden costs done in the lead up to the UN Food System Summit. Those are enormous, $12 trillion. Uh, and if you compare it to the market value of the food system, the food system is about 12% of global GDP. So that's about $10 trillion per year. So the hidden cost uh, of the food system, particularly related to environment and, and nutrition uh, health costs um, are very, very significant. Next slide. Um, and then as you mentioned Hans as well, you know, I mean, so we have a food system that's not food fit for purpose, but then looking forward, I mean, the uh, current and, and, and the emerging challenges are enormous. I mean, the food system needs to produce food for 2 billion more people by 2050. Um, at the same time, I mean, the carbon footprint of the sector needs to be reduced in order to achieve, I mean, the goals of the Paris Agreement. Without food system transition, the goals of the Paris Agreement would not be achieved. And that actually means moving away from business as usual, because with business as usual, the carbon footprint actually will go up. Um, at the same time, uh, producing food for 2 billion more people and reducing the carbon footprint needs to be realized when the headwinds of uh, climate change are blowing harder and harder. And this you can get from the reports from the um, um, IPCC. You know? uh, one, in, one interesting um, figure there is that uh, agricultural productivity would have been 22% higher if there would not have been climate change. So actually farmers are already paying a very steep price um, of climate change around the world. Now, so what needs to happen? Next slide. Um, um, you know, considering that then the global food system not being fit for purpose, uh, the vision is then that the need for a fundamental transformation of the food system that truly supports healthy people, planet, and economy. And, and, and to make that happen, we need to move away, I mean, from the currently very volatile, unsustainable, un unsustainable and inequitable grow towards green, you know, and we need to move towards green, resilient and inclusive um, uh, development. And to achieve that, a number of changes need to happen. No, I'm not going to go in detail, uh, but th those need to happen um, uh, simultaneously. Uh, and of course, these need to happen at the country level. Uh, this is not easy. It's quite complex. And, and particularly when we say, you know, what we know what needs to be done, there might be resources, what, what needs to be done, there might be good examples what needs to be done. But basically to scale it up, I mean, there are also many political sensitivity and what's really missing, we think, is the political will, I mean, by governments, I mean, to take the difficult uh, decisions. Uh, and I think, I mean, that's something to keep in mind when we move forward. Next slide. Now, what does this, mean, what does this vision mean for farmers? Um, you know, we think... Um, that farmers are part of the solution um, and that uh, we need to rethink what it means to be a successful farmer in the 21st century. Farmers should not just be seen as just producers of food, uh, but also as providers of ecosystem services that global society and society is demanding and farmers need to be rewarded uh, for those uh, services. Uh, also, we think, I mean, the farmers should be generators of renewable energy, biogas, I mean, solar, wind, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So the economic perspective, I mean, that we can offer when we move towards scaling up climate smart agriculture is that farmers could actually have three instead of one revenue stream. And as you said, Hans, I mean, farmers are entrepreneurs. I mean, that actually, that message should resonate with them. I mean, so moving from one to three uh, revenue streams. And I think climate smart agriculture can actually make that happen uh, for them. Next, uh, next slide. Uh, now, um, uh, how much needs to be invested actually to, to get a worldwide I mean, food system transformation? We've also done cal calculations about that in the lead up to the UN food system, about 300 to 400 billion dollars per year. Uh, the good news there also is that, um, uh, uh, of course, those costs are very, very significant, but also actually hold the promise of very attractive economic um, returns. There is a very strong business case for food system transformation. That's the core message of this slide. Um, now, how to do that? Uh, next slide. Um, uh, there, um, we put forward, I mean, four eyes. I mean, the, four, the, the first eye is to realign incentives. Um, producer support to agriculture based on OECD data 
for a few years back is between 550 and and 600 billion dollars if you also include support to consumers uh, public support to agriculture and foods is around 700 billion dollars per year most of those incentives um, are not effective uh, only one sixth of those um um uh public support programs are actually in support of public goods um the other uh, is basically very much distorting markets efficiencies negative environmental externalities etc cetera, etc cetera. um so also um um about 33 to 35 cents of every dollar in public uh, support actually hands up in the, in, the, in, in the hands of the farmers. Uh, so considering this, I mean, we think there is a massive opportunity to repurpose, I mean, this $550 billion. I mean, that's now spent uh, on uh, to public support on agriculture um, and actually provide the incentives to farmers to invest in climate smart agriculture, provide the incentive to the private sector to invest in greening supply chains, for instance, uh, uh, you mentioned food loss and waste, Hans, I mean, and cold storage, I mean, um, um, uh, facilities, et cetera, et cetera. Next slide. Um, the next is um, innovation. You also mentioned that. I mean, uh, we need to accelerate uh, agricultural innovation. Uh, right now, farmers are under investing, sorry, counties are under investing in, in um, in agricultural innovation, we use as a yardstick about uh, uh, one percent of agricultural GDP. Most counties actually are uh, below that. At the same time, the returns to agricultural innovation, I think about CGIR, are enormous, thirty to forty percent. Um, so we need um, an urgent need. I mean, to accelerate agricultural innovation. And, and and a couple of changes there, you know, instead of just optimizing productivity, we need to optimize productivity, resilience, and carbon footprints simultaneously. And also we need to strike a better balance between the upstream strategic research and the more downstream adapted uh, research and extension services. Uh, of course, there are no blueprints and there are no silver, there are no, there are no, there are no silver bullets. Next slide, please. Uh, then, um, the third eye is that we need to scale investment, particularly of the private sector. The private sector uh, spends about $2 trillion per year on agriculture and food. This is not just um, uh, investments, but it's also procurement. Uh, we know that the ESG standards um, of the food sector compared to all the sector actually is pretty low. Um, so what can be done, I mean, to provide incentives to farmers, uh, to, to the private sector, to to de-risk, I mean, some of those investments that are needed, but at the same time, in return, I mean, the private sector kind of improving their ESG standards. I mean, so that's the compact, I mean, that we put forward as part of the work that we did on the finance lever for the UN Food System Summit. And uh, so uh, I think that work is, 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 is extremely relevant um, because with the $700 billion in public support and the $2 trillion in private sector spending, there are massive resources available that can be put to work. Uh, final slide. Um, institutions, um, very critical, I mean, to strengthen institutions, I mean, for food systems. As you said, uh, Hans, you know, I mean, food systems might be the new buzzword, uh, but, you know, um, uh, it means that different ministries in the governments actually need to work together more effectively. Uh, it's not just food systems go beyond uh, ministries of agriculture. So in that sense, uh, one of the things that we're working on, you mentioned the stock taking exercise, is how do you put actually a food systems lens, you know, on the budget so that's clear for the various ministries what their interface is with the food system and how they can contribute, I mean, um, to that. There's one final, final slide, uh, just for information. Um, that you know um because this all sounds very good i mean on the how uh we actually in the bank uh and a lot of the uh i mean to setting the states i mean to get those four eyes in place a lot of upstream work is needed uh in that respect uh we established uh, three years ago i mean the food systems 2030 multi-donor trust fund um which aims to provide a catalytic role across these four dimensions um We've raised in the last three years about $200 million, I mean, to support this catalytic work. So we're now actually working in about 20 countries across the various continents uh, in actually moving this agenda forward. And actually what we see also in our lending, um, and, and of course, because of the 
COVID-19 uh, and, the, and, the, and the stimulus packages that many governments have put in place. Um, you know, many ministers of finance are facing fiscal constraints, are rising debt levels, as you also mentioned, uh, Hans. So there is a huge interest by ministers of finance on how they can actually get a bigger bang for their existing public bu uh, buck. So, so we see that this crisis uh, that we're in, and as I started this context, you know, also actually provides a lot of opportunities that we see increasingly reflecting, you know, in the demand that's being put forward for bank financing for agriculture and food. Uh, so I think we're moving in, in the right direction. And of course, um, uh, we are we are very pleased to be part of uh, of Gaxa to get farmers on board actually to make that happen. Uh, with a focus on see how far we can get by 2030. Thanks, Hans. Back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Martin van Nieuwkoop. I can say a lot, but I won't do for the sake of time. But you can be assured that the slides of Martin will be circulated to all members uh, of. Uh, virtually and present today. I now turn to Michael Keller. Michael, I, Mike and I start to know each other when he was Secretary General of the International Seed Federation. And of course we know without seeds, nothing will grow. <laughs> and now he's the chair of the International Agri-Food Network. And we are speaking about the private sector and companies. And I think thanks to the International Agri Food Network, which has an excellent meeting uh, yesterday. I think we get more and more interest, and we have one person who is from the beginning already, from Yara, Yara already is from the beginning here at the, in the Alliance. I think without the companies, without the agri business, nothing will change. So that's, we desperately need companies, not only for the investment, but also for the technologies, also for the capacities. Michael, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dian, dear Dada, if you allow, as you proposed it, <laughs> and dear Martin and, and, and colleagues. Um, yeah, lots of pressure on the private sector. We cannot fill the gap alone. Um, and, and, and let me say, let me just say, I think highly appreciated GAXA as a, and that's the important piece, inclusive multi-stakeholder platform. And inclusiveness is, is somehow the key because it's about all of us together. Again, for what? Supporting the farmers. Looking on Ernie here. I think it is all about our capacity. And, and you speak, Martin and, and um, Hans, um, about country level solution. Now, it's the field, in the field solution. And I think that's the topic. The topic is how we can bring the innovation to the farmer, how we can bring best practices to the farmer, how also farmers can share their best practices with others. This is the topic. Again, Martin, you, you showed nice and important figures. We need to remind us, public funding in agricultural research is going down. It's going down everywhere. The issue is that yes, private sector funding or private sector innovation is heavily increasing everywhere. And we said it. Two folds since 2000, two folds. The point is where we need most the innovation, that's where we cannot really invest vulnerable countries. Give you an example. You take South Sudan, public private investment 10%. Why enabling business environment also? I think this is, I, I'm taking here an example. We can take many other examples. The main issue we are facing is we have lots of innovation. We could have lots of tools making it available to all farmers. And to all farmers means also, yes, we are private sector. Yes, we are looking for a business case. But when we are speaking about making tools available, it needs to be a business case for us, but needs to be, first of all, a business case for the farmers. And I think there's no size of farmers who cannot be a business case to have access also to innovation and to tools. This is the topic, how we can build also in these most vulnerable countries, on the ground, in the fields for each of them, a business case and access um, to tools. Perhaps Gaxa, because you mentioned also, yes, we are entering a new era. 
when GAXA started, it was about climate smart agriculture. Today, we are entering this era of systemic approaches. That means agriculture, it is good because today agriculture is not only seen as the problem. Policy make, policymakers are understanding it's a solution. It's a solution for adaptation to climate change. Mitigation is another piece and it's not a discussion today, but I think everybody agrees today there are tremendous opportunities in our capacity to drive agricultural production to help also to address um, climate change. Yes, there is a new era because we know also at COP now, agriculture is part of the debate. And I think that's also a new thing which happened after climate, um, after GAXA was founded. And I think that's an important recognition and we need to use this. And I think therefore a platform like GAXA should be our inclusive multi-stakeholder platform where it's not about only here, expanding global adoption. It's about really how can we act, how we can build this action on the ground, this project based and I, Agnes mentioned, yeah, come to the fields. Yes, it's about this, how we can drive together. And I think that's the call from the private sector also, how we can drive together this project-based action together within also um, GAXA. The International Agri-Food Network um, is representing the whole diversity of the agricultural production system and up to the value chain. 15 international organizations from input to food and beverage, let's make it short, including the farmers. And I think our own goal, only goal is about engagement, but it's about making things happen. And yesterday you mentioned it, it was important for us. We had a, a full day with FAO on, yeah, partnering for betters, the four betters. Um, and, and Yes, we would like to see even more engagement. You mentioned we could, we should go further because the private sector is seen um, as a solution. But therefore, all opportunities for us to engage, but to engage concretely is something we are looking for. With that, ready to continue the discussions with you, ready to continue also to see how we can drive further together um, GAXA. And thanks again for having also because I think, yeah, this trust in the private sector that we can and we will contribute also to achieve our sustainable development goals. We heard yesterday we have to rescue them. Can we rescue them? I don't know, but count on us to be contributing. Thanks for this. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Michael, for such a passionate speech calling for the creation of enabling environment for businesses to really thrive and support, right? Because there's really mm. no lack or shortages of innovation. So, um, but before I, I go to the next speaker, I wanted to react quickly. You, I very much appreciate that you mentioned that agriculture is now included at COP, right? And in fact, there's now this landmark decision on just for agriculture within COP. And I wanted to just point out that we have actual negotiators within the room from Southeast Asia. They're the ones really creating policies that hopefully will support some of the investments needed mm -hmm. and the enabling environment needed for businesses to thrive. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to point that out. There's probably also other negotiators that are really inside the room creating policies. So you started your speech with inclusiveness, right? And it's my pleasure to ensure that the youth's voice, as we say often the problems with agriculture is that it, there's really a dying population or very older population. So we really wanted to ensure that the youth is engaged in our total transformation measures. So it's my pleasure, Divine, to welcome you. We've just had a quick chat over email I think at 4 or 5 a.m when I couldn't sleep today 
and trying to cancel another engagement, right? For because of um, our annual forum. So Divine and uh, NTO come. This is my pleasure to introduce you as the founder and managing director of the CSA Youth Network. Divine, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. Perfect. Thank you very much. Greetings from Cameroon. I'm very excited to be part of this uh, discussion. First of all, I have two points here before I get into my presentation. You can find over there. Gapsa, I just heard Ambassador Han saying Gapsa will be 10 years next year. I want to echo here that Gapsa and CSAYN were founded the same year, the same month of May 2014. Uh, and we are so happy to be part of this annual forum, which is timely. Especially when I heard my mother, Agnes Kalibata, being the special envoy who appointed me back uh, in 2020 to be one of the food system summit champions, which of course occurred to the entire world that we were the most strongly represented group to mobilize over 1,000 plus people, stakeholders, community leaders within the food system summit process. And of course, we are so proud to be here. By the way, um, I heard about uh, my predecessors mentioned about expanding, which of course is the term of this uh, forum, expanding globally and adapting to climate smart agriculture. Uh, we changed our strategy a few months ago because we came to realize that working as countries or within countries uh, at the policy level was not going to be the best. So we decided to go right down at the grassroots level. That's why on my screen right there, you can find that we've been able to set up a couple of uh, centers of excellence, which are actually within primary schools, secondary schools, T-Birds, and equally university level. We want to go right down at the grassroots level, at the primary school, where children are still being taught how to maybe put on their shirts and their trousers to go to school. So we are ensuring that they set up what we call home schools, agri clubs, within schools, and we've done that so far, so good. So those are the statistics. We have 47, as of date, the centers of excellent globally, within five, across five continents, 23 countries across the world. Yes, and then we have over 40. We have five continents. We have uh, 14 from Africa, North America, we have three. South America, we have one. Asia, we have two. And then Europe, we have one. And in Asia, I want to be very more specific here. We have pure rice. We have a strong MOU with pure rice. Pure rice, which is based in Philippines, that is much more focused on rice transformation. So we'll be sending interns, young students, young uh, academician researchers over there to pure rice for internship and exchange program, which of course we're already piloting within the CSYN agenda. We only have um, the two regional economic commissions, like um, uh, Acerica for Central and Eastern Africa, and then Cadesa for the study. We've signed MOUs with them. Just to let the world here know that uh, we are not be sleeping for the past nine years, and in 10 years next year. It's been a success and really success. Uh, we have 13 uh, international institutions, yeah, uh, ICA, we can name them, and then equally have 21 universities across the globe and 11 high schools and primary schools. And of course, we are including the United States, uh, the state of uh, Connecticut when I was there last year. I mean, I was able to set up a club, a, a, a chapter of CSA where we did the school there in Connecticut. So we are so, ha we are so happy about ourselves. We are so happy to be part of this forum. Unfortunately, we could not join you guys in person, but of course, I'm happy to you know to tell us that uh, we have our colleague, Domenico, who actually runs the program across the year. He's right there, who is speaking so much and strongly in person. And I'm so proud to say that the team we have right now, of course, Ambassador Hans has been there. He was there when we were launching our e-learning platform because we came to realize that it's not just talking about technology. It's not just talking about funding. It's not just talking about young people, women. We need to give them that space, okay? So that a young person in Africa can actually connect with a young person from South America. It's for this reason we're able to work very strongly with our team within uh, the CSAYN agenda to set up what we call the uh, CSYN Virtual Academy um, e-learning platform. In this e-learning platform, the interns, we have over 120 interns across all the centers of excellence. We are making sure that they benchmark with the various young people. 
the various women, with the various children in their various constituencies. And that's why, more specifically, to ensure that the program, the GAFSA agenda, which we have been part of since inception back in 2014, and equally being one of the strategic committee members for GAFSA, we've decided to, we decided to start up women's program, Women in Youth in Women Agriculture System Africa, and Children in Youth in Agriculture. So, all of this has actually given us a lot of stepping stone to reach where we are today. And of course, in the afternoon, I should be speaking, or maybe some few hours, I should speak the youth session, but I'm going to go detailedly on some of our outreach and actually some of our capacity and what we've been able to do to have this established. With this, I want to thank that as a area, and the, all of them, they have been very, very much uh, supportive. And of course, Ambassador Hans, the co-chair, Dada, thanks. I mean, you remind everyone that we'll be discussing this morning to see how we can like, shift our agendas to meet up this meeting. With this, I want to thank you very much. Thank you very much, and greetings from Cameroon. Over. Thank you very much, Yvonne, for such a presentation that gives us hope and optimism, knowing that there's the youth involvement all over these total number of institutions. And we wanted to say we're here to help you grow your number. Um, there's a, a slight noise on the side when we heard Phil rise because um, I think Dr. Margaret's father is the founding, as a founder of Phil Rice. So let us know if you need more expansion and we're, we're really here to help you. And I think that the, the presentation from Divine wraps up um, our opening session that ends in optimism, but I wanted to go back to some of the key messages from this opening session. For example, um, Martin's, Martin's presentation really echoes a lot of what we have learned. Um, last week, um, the government of Vietnam hosted One Planet's fourth global conference on sustainable food system. And really a lot of what you mentioned that we are going to be delayed in the achievement of the SDG. There are different studies, but it seems like 25 years even delayed or 10 years delayed, there's all these these things. And I think what really struck me in your presentation, Martin, is the critical role that we now have to find for CSA within this huge network of concepts, interrelated actors, multi-institutions that's going to have to move in really an aligned and cohesive manner, no? and the role of political support. But also being always a a half glass full person. I, there's, there's an immense task that we need to do. But I really think, um, um, Martin, moving away from business as usual scenarios, there's so many initiatives happening all over the globe now, right? Of how we could move away from business away, uh, business as usual scenario and really contribute towards the transformation. So both Martin and Michael's presentation really calls for investments and more the creation of an enabling environment that would support more investments towards this transformation. And we hope that GAXA could really play a role in the creation of this enabling environment, either through uh, exchange of information, policy implications. I think um, some of the what some of the projects being approved now by the Green Climate Fund are really all about readiness to create investment plans that will be backed by climate science. So we're really hoping to get into that. But the, the, the most compelling message that comes is really from Dr. Kalibata asking us, right, to rise to the challenge of raising our voices higher and elevating local action. So I think let's remember that for our as our the key message of our opening session. Yeah. And with that, I think I also have the honor to now move into session two, if you will allow me. Or if is there any reaction from the group about the key messages from the opening session? Otherwise, we'll move to session two because we identified that really. I think, Mark, uh, Michael, you mentioned innovation a lot in your speech, because this is really in order to respond to the climate crisis, interrelated risks that are all there, 
compelling us to the crisis. We really need to look at innovation and technology and work towards scaling them up. And the good facilitation unit of GAXA together with the co-chair has put together some success case studies that will be shared with us today. And our first case will be, I'm honored to introduce Dr. Kirit Nanubai Shalat to give us um, an, a short presentation. Dr. Shalat, we met at COP27. Um, well, you were online and I was there um, shivering in the cold air conditioned tent in COP27 <laughs> in the middle of the desert. So Dr. Shalat, we would be very uh, curious to really hear a good case study on scaling up innovation. And um, hopefully it will be a brief presentation, Dr. Shalat. <laughs> the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning to everybody. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be part of this very important deliberation for solving or meeting the challenge that the world is facing today on uh, front of food security, poverty, and food for hungry millions. Salute to all. I congratulate uh, Gaksha Functional Unit for organizing this uh, uh, very good meeting with virtual participation. I see Federica Beck on the team, and uh, let us take this um, program forward. I will start because we are talking about technology and I will start with Indian perspective. And in India developed sustainable agriculture. It have had recurrent famines, which like what we are facing today, we faced it in early 50s, used to import food grains. We had 90% of families below poverty line and uh, 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 there were starvations and so on and so forth. Uh, today, it is self-sufficient in agriculture, food, and it exports. This is story of last 70 years because India prioritized agriculture, animal husbandry, fisheries, and particularly farmers. It introduced technology-driven agriculture, animal husbandry, and fisheries. It paid special support to marginal and small poor farmers, animal holders, and fishermen, and focused on reduction of poverty with massive water harvesting program. It introduced technology through induced development, which is combination of communication, information to farmer, doorstep delivery, and guidance of how to use appropriate technology with scaling it down for small holder. Most importantly, it made technology adoption affordable by subsidizing it introduction. This is very key. We have variety of technologies, but farmer can't afford it. So we have to subsidize it, make it such, scale it down to the requirement of his land. There are small holdings or one animal, two animals. So how do we scale down the technology available and how do we make it affordable? so that farmer can adopt it. Otherwise, he will just stare at a big farmer, how he is using his technology. In the arena of climate change, India introduced climate resilient program. And now all its agriculture is climate resilient or climate smart agriculture. Because today we are in arena of climate change. There is no question of any agriculture activity which is not smart. So we have to think First important thing is that all agriculture is climate smart agriculture. Second, focus is to be on farmer. We have to make farmer climate smart. So in India introduced, we introduced in India selection of crops based on soil health analysis by farmers, selection of crops which can be sustained by soil fertility, promoted natural farming, that is uh, uh, no chemical inputs in the farm, uh, uh, introduce solar energy where excess energy is bought by electricity company and it is a confirmed source of income to farmers because farmer does produce excess solar energy then it can use. It has now recently introduced seaweed development. Seaweeds are growing in seawater not dependent on rainfall. Introduce weather advisory followed by agro advisory 
and we set up a separate agromet uh, department of metrology department which is responsible for this promoted vermi wash and compost introduced uh, resistant seed varieties and strengthened its infrastructure for storage transport marketing export and communication all this involves now this is second key important uh, recommendation convergence of efforts led by the leadership with focus on farmers scientists extension network community uh, leaders civil society members agri marketing and milk cooperatives input and agro industries supported by very active public leadership by public leadership we mean both uh, the permanent administration and elected people most importantly uh, it set up in each district agro scientists agro science center known as kvk which has nine scientists of different discipline and mandate is to guide farmer and visit them the spot visit this is backed by liberal crop and animal insurance schemes and minimum support price nccst which is our organization we are a civil society organization working in villages with a consortium of ngos we are working in about 1000 villages we worked in collaboration with florida agriculture mechanical university farmu usa to promote csa and develop guidelines for building climate smart farmers we are working in different climatic zones of gujarat and maharashtra state of india and it is realized that wherever farmers have followed climate smart agriculture guidelines and weather advisory they have increased income by 30% irrespective of uh, problems of uh, weather and now we are working on second edition of climate smart uh, uh, building climate smart farmer uh, because uh, the, the situation is becoming from bad to worse now i request uh, nisa who is uh, our ceo to take this forward nisa yeah thank you so much sir and thank you so much to baksa for giving us the opportunity to share our experience in this forum uh, i would like to just share our because as our executive chairman mentioned uh, we are working in the more than 1000 villages so we have a practical experience and based on this practical experience uh, i would like to share two or three points we are talking about the technology and innovations how it is affordable and accessible last month we had a meeting with the farmers of the one state gujarat state i asked one question and i says ke if you the answer is yes you just raise your hand i asked the questions you are 300 farmers who are from the states are here you all have a smart mobile phone all the farmers hands raised like this two hands right good second question i asked okay very good you all are using the whatsapp and youtube and all the farmers including women and men they all are laughing and they raise their both hand and say yes we are using the whatsapp and use youtube then i say okay, very good then i say the last and third questions you all have a tractor or power tiller or machineries like sprinkler or a sprayer how many farmers know how to repair and maintain it if it is are not using please raise your hand surprised four or five young farmers or uh, farmers who are like a little bit educated they raise their both hand and i say see we are the farmers we are working on the ground level right we know how to use the technology of course we are the farmers our last generations also doing the farming and we don't know how to repair the tractor how to maintain the tractor okay we our water is a saline if some uh, salt are stuck in our nozzle and our sprinkler are not working how we can repair it no we don't know so that's why i am asking question to you why i am sharing this example in this uh, forum because technology and innovations are like a link we all have a technology in the country but 
how it is affordable and accessible our farmers who are very poor who have a like a very small patch of land we call in the in this uh, india in the especially gujarat states like a bigha it's a very small like two or five bigas farmers are there in the meeting they are affordable the ug uh, 2g 3g 4g network they are paying a 100 rupees and 200 rupees for their net also then i say ki why you are not using the same money for the training you spend you contribute little bit and take a training because this is our main occupation so a uh, need to uh, like focus and launch a campaign farmers they understand farmers they are sitting there they understood what i am trying to say them so they say yeah you are right they have this knowledge they have this information but how as a country how as a organizations how as a forum how as a council we can share with them and we can like organize them and we gave them a training and this realize that this is your main job and you have to do like this so need to prove that awareness for the innovations as a campaign program in this scenario of the global warming this is the first things we always realize and in the state of the gujarat where we are working we are doing uh, for our farmers who are women and men technology is available and it reach at the certain level this is the main things i had experience of the uh, 22 years I I I worked since last twenty two years in the Ita, same. Ita, could you wrap up because we are a little bit pressed for time? Yeah. So, uh, how we can upscale it? At present, we are working for the thousands and lakhs. But how whole state? How whole the country? How we can do that? How the farmers they are using the technologies? Just one little uh, one uh, recommendations that I had experience. That's why how we can do the EDB program. EDB means the exposure dialogue program. the philippines have a one uh, expertise indonesia have one expertise india have a one expertise nepal bangladesh how we can do how can work together and how we can share their expertise innovation technology at the south asia level and share with uh, our countries and like we take it forward if it is usable if it is uh, accessible affordable then like farmers are using the whatsapp the technology also are using farmers that that look that there's of own we don't want to invest more but if it is affordable accessible and farmer know that technology in its increase that profit or income in the farming then the 100% using and the young generations start to involve in this so thank you so much for the giving us the opportunity for uh, this presentation thank you so much uh, chair of the kaksa and all the participant participants for uh, listening us and thank you so much yeah Thank you so much, Kirit and Nisha, for your presentation. We try now to make it a little bit more interactive, uh, so that you don't only listen but also have the possibility to make remarks or uh, ask questions. I look around both the physical room as well as the virtual room. Whether or not somebody would like to ask a question or make a remark. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so you see, uh, would, you, would you please uh, state your? Uh, of okay. course, I know you, but for everybody, that's it. <laughs> I'm Margaret Yuatana. I am uh, uh, the director of International Agricultural Affairs Group of the Department of Agriculture uh, of Thailand. I am also a, uh, a member of the ASEAN CRN, and uh, and so I just like to to comment. on uh, on the uh, as was we already heard uh, particularly on india's presentation so i could sense that uh, we have commonalities uh, and uh, as uh, the co-chair dada already mentioned that there are a lot of uh, activities initiatives already on the ground and and uh, and uh, thank you martian and michael for for your insights on how we could systematically move forward so still the question is how do we scale up that is the, the the main problem actually that we are facing we have a good enabling policy 
uh, uh, political support is there. Uh, we prioritize uh, uh, CSA activities. Um, but in the NDC, we still have uh, uh, prioritize on uh, transportation and energy, but th the contribution of agriculture is still very little. So we are thinking to really highlight on the adaptation co-benefits, uh, how we could really uh, uh, um, scale this up. And so this, uh, what I'm saying is that we already have uh, those initiatives, programs, CSA programs, uh, but uh, we really need this scaling up. And so I, I would like to hear some GAXAS uh, direction on how we really scale up direct to the grounds, direct to the farmers. So I think um, GAXA would be best on this. So I, I really have high hopes that uh, uh, what we could output from this uh, forum will be really put on the grounds and, and really solve this problem of scaling up. Thank you. Thank you very much for your remark, a crucial remark, because that's why we are here in Rome uh, or in the virtual room to see how we, if we have good examples in practice, how can we learn from it and how to scale up? And I think that's one of the messages I think we have to see in the course of today and tomorrow also, when we have some of new projects to be done by GAXA, how we can work with that. I give the floor to Ernie, Ernie Shee. I think you hit the nail on the head. It's about implementation. And as we set the stage this morning, this afternoon, uh, I've got the good fortune of moderating the action group reporting out session where we're going to have five examples of very innovative uh, approaches to implement climate smart ag systems that sustainably intensify production that improve resilience and concurrently reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So this is uh, this is why we're reconvening after a two or three year hiatus is to look back and, and lift up some of this great work that's underway. Thank you very much, Ernie. It's already resonating now and I think that's important. And of course that's the strength of GAXA because we are an alliance or a network and together we can do more if we reach out to each other and help each other, support each other. There was a question online, I think. That's um, perhaps it's relevant also for some of our members to answer. There's a question on, I think it's related to Dr. Margaret's question. Uh, how do we integrate technological advancement with the farmer field school approach in smart climate agriculture with smallholder farmers? any idea from from anyone? And this came from Mr. Fongo Eric. Reflections. Let's think about it and, sorry. Do you want me to respond? Yes. No, 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 it was already. So, yeah, so I'm happy to just share a few reflections from a company perspective. So <clears throat> I work in Yara, so we are a global fertilizer company. Uh, we have very deep agronomic knowledge that can support farmers. Uh, and we have 800 agronomists around markets all over the world. Of course, 800 agronomists can only talk you to a limited number of farmers. So we are working to digitize our knowledge and make that knowledge available to the farmers meaning that we have to connect to the farmers. So in uh, Asia, as an example, about 30% of our total sales in Asia is now being done through digital channels, meaning that we know who the retailer is, uh, who the farmer is, and with knowledge about the farmer's uh, crops and the location, we can give very targeted and specific advice uh, to the farmers on how to use our products. But this doesn't scale in itself because we are just one company and there are dozens and hundreds of companies competing about the farmer's attention. So we need to ensure that the digital systems are interoperable. So we are now shaping the algorithms we use to provide advice in such a way that our solutions can also be embedded into the offering of other companies. 
so that uh, their apps or their digital tools can send data back for us being analyzed and a piece of advice is being sent forward again. So I think <clears throat> this way of uh, ensuring interoperability is uh, one way forward to make sure that technology can reach as many farmers as possible. Thank you very much. Great example. I think that we certainly use it. For the sake of time, we continue now to go to our second speaker on the innovation and technology. And that's Christina Chirico. Chirico. It's always difficult to pronounce uh, last name. So that's why they always call me Hans because my other name is impossible yeah. to pronounce. <laughs> <laughs> but Christina is the head of Internet Internationalization Office of the Confederazione Italiana Agricoltori. And she was very much active also in the, as, and I would say, establishment of the World Farmers Organization, as well as uh, the Minute World Farmers or the IFAP Mediterranean Committee. Christina, very much welcome. We would really would like to listen to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm here, I'm very proud to be here. Thank you for the invitation because uh, we are members of GAXA uh, through our association Agricoltura e Vita. The name means uh, agriculture is life. So it's a, an impressive uh, meaning for us, very important for us. And uh, uh, we give uh, um, a strategic importance as uh, the representatives of the Italian farmers uh, uh, to the research and Agricoltura e Vita is uh, a, a real um, research body from CIA, Agricoltura Italiani. And it is also a vocational training association uh, to deliver uh, knowledge and instruments to the farmers and to the technicians. And so um, we are very glad to know GAXA is putting farmers at the center of, of the work and also of the dialogue today. Uh, it is a, a very important network in order to understand uh, the, the meaning of, of the term um, innovation and technology. And obviously uh, we see access to innovation and technology from our point of view, the point of view, the perspective of farmers. So um, let permit me uh, to, to say that we work a lot as the, as the Italian farmers in research and dissemination project delivered directly to the farms, um, research projects, but also concrete services to, to, the, to, the, to the farmers. And which is our method? Uh, we have a direct exchange and uh, um, network with the, the scientific realities in Italy, university, and also research centers. And uh, in order to maximize the dissemination and the acquisition of new technology or new knowledge by the farmers. But at the same time, I would like to stress that we apply a farmer to farmer approach. It's not enough for us, the direct link with the universities and the research centers. It is extremely important in order to deliver knowledge to farmers to create a direct link between farmer to farmer. This is very successful for us. And we would like also to, to have a change with other experience on this table with the same, the same aspect. Our key messages today, uh, to be briefed, are based on our direct experience. The first is the relevance of training for farmers. All innovation must be supported for us by training and dissemination to farmers. Consider obviously that we, we are thinking to deliver the latest technology available at the moment, but at the same time, it's also important sharing the knowledge. The other aspect that I would like to stress today is the access to the innovation. It is also the economic sustainability of innovation. Technology must be economically sustainable for farmers. We have to consider the cost of te the technology today because if we put so importance to innovation and knowledge for the climate resilience of farmers, we have to consider how farmers can have 
the availability of this uh, innovation or this technology into the farm. So the cost of technology is also important for us. The third aspect that I would like to stress today is a follow virtuous paths in the transfer of technology. What does it mean for us? To be useful, the application of a new technology and innovation must be adequate to the level of development of a, a reality of a, an agriculture a sector, not be too sophisticated because they have to enter in the currently in the daily activity of the farmers. Do not bring just technology. You, we have to give knowledge to people, knowledge to farmers and training to them, obviously, as I said. We have some specific experience in Italy, but also abroad. For example, we are working in a, a project in Albania. It is a small country in, in Europe. Uh, our first action of our association is training the local expert to work with the farmers organization, obviously with, with the, the same aspect. And we're working uh, today in a project, the name is Rural Albania, financed by the Italian Agency of the International Cooperation, dedicated to it. But another aspect that I would like to give to you today, it is another aspect linked to the role of the farmers organization and the training bodies promoted by the farmers organization to represent the real needs of farmers. The dialogue, the dialogue is very important, but we have to dialogue with, with the farmers on the field, but also through their representatives. In Italy, we say that the farmers organization are intermediate bodies in order to have a clear picture of the reality on the field. And farmers organization are working today for this aspect. Another aspect, we insist on the need of capacity building. It's not easy to represent the need. So we have to, to learn how to do it. It, it, it has to be one of, part of the program also for us of, of GAXA. I have to conclude because we have to be brief. Um, I would like to give to you a best practice that we consider a best practice. And we invest a lot on it recently um, with a memorandum of understanding with, with our organization, Italian Farmers Confederation and CREA. CREA is the public Italian council for research in agriculture and it is also member of GATSA. And we created a network a link between CREA, between the 72 uh, research centers of CREA uh, in, in, in Italy, and our young farmers. Because for us, research, innovation, new technology means put youth at the center. So in this uh, collaboration, in which we are working on, uh, we are finalizing investment in knowledge, investment in research concretely with the young farmers in, um, in Italy. So to conclude, uh, we believe in this collaboration. We are working a lot on uh, knowledge sharing, innovation, and we affirm the need for more resources. This is the first aspect, uh, adequate policies linked to the needs of, of the farmers, as I said, so that research and farmers can find effective solution against climate change together. So this is my message today to you and I would like to share with you our experience. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christina. Um, especially also because we always speak about, when we speak about innovation and technology, about accessibility, affordability, and how to implement it. But you put forth a clear necessary dimension it's not only that you have access to the technology, but also how to get the knowledge to use it and how to get the training to do it. Because otherwise it doesn't make sense. And I think certainly tomorrow when we speak about some of the new activities of GAXA, I think it's very important to implement it as well. Uh, with that, I give the floor to, or first to the audience, whether or not yeah. there are questions or remarks. I see two, there is a microphone for, uh, those who are sitting in the second row. Thank you. Mr. Okovay. Hans, it's Hans. easier. Okay. Um, 
Good morning, everybody. My name is Judith de Voor, and I'm a farmer from the Netherlands. Uh, together with my husband, I run a regenerative dairy farm. So, um, and I am a member of the Global Farmer Network. And I really, really appreciate um, the message you're saying, because I strongly believe that farmers from all over the world have a lot of knowledge as well to share together, uh, to learn from best practices as well. And the Global Farmer Network is a, a network with 240, almost 250 farmers from all over the world. Like I am from the Netherlands, there's farmers from Italy as well, but also Honduras, the Philippines, South Africa, Mexico, Brazil, almost every country is a member. And what I see is that farmers can learn a lot from each other as well. And I guess that's really important for you as well to know, because you're um, we are talking about making sure for access to new technologies needs training, but we can share a lot of knowledge as well. So I know farmers from South America that practice no tillage for decades already. So there's a lot of things uh, as farmers we can share with each other, but also with the entire network, because it's really important that we work together with this and think with the farmer, work with the farmers together. So I'm really excited and thrilled about the words you're saying. And I'm a strong believer in farmer to farmer, but also farmers as part of the network working together. Thank you. Thank you very much for the strong message. We certainly have to take it up. I give you the floor again. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for giving me another chance. But I really like what uh, he was saying. She was saying because we did it in Thailand already, that uh, we we have uh, established 882. We call it learning centers, wherein all uh, all the ministry ministries are helping uh, uh, in in every center, and and uh, we we in each uh, learning centers. Uh, because you know, ge geographically, geographical nature is different from from uh, each location. So, so they are concentrating on the geographical characteristic of, it. and they uh, we have this. We call it local philosopher. Uh, the village uh, in in one village, you have this. Uh, uh, you know, those who are already old and they have this experience and knowledge indigenous knowledge in the locality. So uh, we, we designate them as someone who could design uh, a kind of a, a, a production or agriculture uh, system in, in every specific location. So, so that is a very, a very good, uh, very good examples. And, and uh, it's effective actually uh, that, that uh, enhance the integrated approach of all in this interministerial uh, approach. And also it is designed by farmers themselves, by the local communities themselves. They learn from one another. And, and also that it allows inter, uh, across uh, cross community learnings when 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 uh, when we organize some kind of uh, uh, study visits exchange of visits from M and each community thank you very thank you very much and of course we're here to share so please do one last hello together my name is Nala Muller and I am a uh, President of uh, the NGO Femme et Enfants in DRC Congo, Democratic Republic of Congo. And I totally agree with what, uh, what Ms. Kiriko said about knowledge to share that. We had an activity with young people in DRC, so an agro tour. Uh, it is a training camp. So to we, we we knew to some young people, not just from DLC, but also for another country. And uh, we realized that there is a problem with, uh, all, there is problem with young people and they can also share their solution, not just in one country, in DLC or any else, but they can share this experience and also solution what they have. And it is very important this knowledge and um, also, how they can 
how they can also uh, reach the government. And so we, we develop a program so to connect the young people also with the government, what the speaker said, uh, the great uh, intervention they did, we need a, a national solution too. And then this program allow us to share all issue of young people with the government. And uh, so we need to work together and also to establish another partnership or to, to work uh, with another stakeholders or not just one uh, country, but also to have experience of uh, foreign uh, country. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. The sharing just goes to show that we have so many amazing stories. No, as Christina was sharing uh, their experience with the Italian farmers, it makes me reflect as well as to what's happening in the Southeast Asian region. And so we heard perspective from from the presentation, short, brief, and. Um, <clears throat> mighty presentation of Christina, we got the voice from the farmers organization, from the government and from the NGO. So, and, and I know that there's more amazing stories if we just have more time. So, <clears throat> so that was great. And now we're still discussing, uh, we're still on the issue of innovation and technology. And I'm very excited to introduce the next speaker because I've recently been attending hackathons which seems to really emphasize a lot of innovation coming up, especially from the youth sector. So let's hear it from Mr. Walid Nassar, who is online. He's the founder and CEO of, this is hard for me to pronounce, Ziz, there are 31. Um, Walid, I'm sure you will pronounce it better for us, which is a digital agriculture platform offering precision farming solutions in Egypt. Why does the floor is yours? Well, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Sherman, for giving me the chance to be among this uh, uh, marvelous group. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, Zarai. Zarai, uh, it's how, this is how it's written. It means uh, my crop in Arabic. So we write it in Franco-Arab letters to, to be written in English letters. So it's simply my crop written in Arabic. So it's Zarai. And that's a message that I want to highlight if I want to highlight something here. It's about localization and adoption of innovation in, in new markets and new uh, emerging countries. This is the key. I, I recall a, a message from a, a very important speaker about how can we adapt this technology into uh, new markets and new fields and new countries. I believe localization is the key for, for, for adopt, adopting new technologies. And actually uh, for a greenfield market like Egypt, where, where uh, my startup is coming from, uh, I believe uh, adopting existing technology that has been propagated all over the world, that's a key, a, a key progress. Uh, that's an, my introduction message. Uh, myself, I would like to introduce myself from, as Walid Nasr, I'm the CEO of uh, Zarae. I'm a computer engineer coming with 24 years of experience working with global vendors like Oracle and SAP and ESRI before. That is my startup uh, for, for the last 15 months now. Uh, we are addressing the main challenges affecting the agriculture industry, the economical stress, the water stress, and climate change, because climate change has been hurting uh, uh, the agriculture industry in Egypt and all over the world. Uh, we are coming with a solution to, uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, introduce new technology to the market to help farmers optimizing their cultivation process and efficiently utilizing the resources. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we came up with three main services. We believe that three, these three main services will uh, complement the whole crop production lifetime cycle uh, in the field. So we are offering crop monitoring and crop management and crop insurance services. Uh, for crop monitoring uh, 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 and applying GIS and remote sensing and satellite imaging into the, uh, 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 the agricultural industry in Egypt, that's something very new. And uh, what we have been amazed by the eagerness of the smallholder farmers in Egypt to adopt this new technology because 
uh, at the green field, farmers are eager and they are hungry to, to use tools and use technology to help them uh, uh, in their cultivation process and their agriculture uh, activities. So uh, I will not go through the uh, services, but I want to highlight uh, uh, key messages here. For addressing climate uh, hazards and climate uh, smart agriculture, we believe that uh, climate financing is important to be to, to address this climate change. And for climate financing, we are uh, offering two main services that I want to highlight. Next slide, please. First is carbon farming and carbon sequestration. That's part of our proactive approach to climate smart agriculture, because a, a, a carbon uh, sequestration, that's uh, uh, important income for, uh, for uh, uh, smallholder farmers and also uh, directly addressing net zero uh, global targets and the global sustainable development goals. And here I would like to highlight the challenge. The challenge is in financing and funding such a project for the first time in Egypt. And we are implementing carbon farming and carbon sequestration on palm trees. Palm trees for the first time in the world to apply carbon uh, sequestration on palm trees and apply regenerative agriculture uh, uh, in Egypt, in Siwa Oasis, by the way, in, in, in South Egypt. Uh, for introducing new technologies, user adoption is, a, is, a biggest, is the biggest challenge, but we have seen uh, lots of attention and lots of uh, interest from, small, from smallholder farmers across Egypt and all over the MENA region. But funding for such projects is a, is a challenge. We have been trying to fund this project with Acorn Rabobank project, uh, sorry, uh, with Acorn project with Rabobank for the past few months. Uh, it's a challenge, but again, funding is the main challenge for introducing new technology. Uh, second slide, please. Crop insurance. And crop insurance ag against climate risk mitigation. That's the main message that we are trying to, to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to say here and to mention how we are addressing climate change and climate smart react, uh, agriculture reactively. Because uh, for the first time in Egypt, for the first time after 15 months of talking to Mystery Insurance, which is a national insurance company and other uh, 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 governmental organizations, for the first time, Egypt will, will release the first crop insurance policy in the next few weeks. Uh, Zara'i, as a startup, we are providing the risk mitigation services uh, to support Mr. Insurance and the National Insurance Company to provide this crop insurance. We do that uh, proactively by assessing the historical performance of the crop and the climate hazards effect on the crop to uh, help the insurance company assess uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the insurance value. Also, uh, reactively, when there is an incident or a climate hazard that affected the, the, the crop, that's when there is a claim and uh, we help the, uh, the insurance company through uh, remote sensing and satellite imaging to assess the damage that, 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 that's affected the crop and the reimbursement value. We can do that using technology in days, not weeks or months. We can do that in days. I think this is, those are two examples of, of uh, climate smart agriculture technologies that we are trying to introduce in Egypt and uh, across the MENA region, Middle East and North Africa region. And uh, uh, I can mention two things here. First, technology adoption and, and user adoption is a key for adopting new technologies in greenfield markets and emerging markets. Funding and financing for new uh, initiatives and new services, that's uh, 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 very important uh, uh, to, to help this new technology reach new markets. And I believe that startups, Zara'i and other startups all over the world are a good vehicle to connect uh, technology and NGOs 
and government organizations and, st and uh, smallholder farmers and agricultural companies in, in the local markets. Uh, that's a message I wanted to, uh, to say in this uh, important uh, meeting. Thank you very much. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, please. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity and for uh, <coughs> telling you uh, about uh, the founder journey for the past for 15 months in an emerging market. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Walid, and certainly uh, we will share your slides to all the members present here in the room and virtually. Now, also for the sake of time, I would like to turn to Gladys, Gladys Morales, and she is the Senior Officer, Change Delivery and Innovation, look to the wording, Change and Innovation Delivery at EVAS Change Delivery, uh, sorry, at the Office of the Pres President and Vice President of IFAD. And of course, IFAD is a very strong organization here in Rome supporting farmers on the ground. It's my pleasure to give the floor to Gladys. Thank you so much, Chair. Um, we could move to the presentation. I would like to, before we start, I would like to uh, thank you for the invitation, uh, not only the forum organizers, but everybody that is here uh, participating today. So uh, if we could have the slides up, please. So um, very quickly for uh, those people in the audience that are not uh, familiar with um, IFAT and the work that we do on innovation, I would just like to give a first glance to IFAT. Let's move to the next slide, please. So very much at a glance, um, since 1978, IFAT has been investing 518 billion in, in of those 20 uh, that have reached uh, 518 billion, and uh, um, we have invested 23.2 billion in grants and consultancy loans. What is the main challenge that we're facing today, and something that we keep repeating, and we uh, both FAO and IFAD were advocating for at the latest COP? Climate change is a reality, and of climate change, the small scale farmers and indigenous populations are the ones that have contributed the least to climate change. And yet, they are the ones that are most affected by climate change. Yet, those investments that we uh, were talking about before, and I really appreciated Michael's words about how the amount of investments in research uh, is decreasing. But not only the amount of investments in research, also the, the portion of those investments that we're making on innovation and on climate ad adaptation, the amount of those investments that reach smallholders and indigenous populations is minimal compared to the damage that we are, um, you know, all of us are contributing to, to, their, to their livelihoods. Uh, another piece of information that I think is important is that small scale farmers earn only 6% for every dollar of food that they produce. <clears throat> We also um, jointly argued how every dollar that we spend on resilience now today saves up to ten dollars uh, in emergency aid in the future. That's very very important data because you know we we keep we keep talking about um, responding to emergencies, but if we build the resilience before through through uh, climate smart agriculture and through innovation, we can uh, save a significant amount of in contributions. Let's move to the next slide, please. So I wanted to focus now on um, in, in innovation, the Change Delivery and Innovation Unit. Uh, I lead the corporate and also the programmatic um, aspect of innovation for the organization. And to resonate some of the words that have been saying, as I've been saying before my intervention, three main approaches are important when we deal with climate smart agriculture and innovation. The, uh, those three factors have to do with uh, the increasing productivity, of course, building resilience, and um, at the same time, reducing emissions. So in terms of that approach, we uh, make maximum use of natural processes and ecosystems, less external inorganic inputs and waste, 
diversity and proportionality of production, and a mixture of traditional and new technologies. Without, because we're, we're scarce in time, I won't go into the details of this, but I think that it's, uh, it's crucial here also that in our interventions, that uh, the approach that we use in, in innovation is uh, multiple benefits. So in terms of multiple benefits, what we see across our projects is that we are reducing emissions, we're enhancing resilience, increasing productivity, increasing yields. Um, there is local uh, pollution reduction, and there is, of course, poverty reduction. Next. So before we move to the specific case, uh, case studies that we have, um, before me, uh, Cristina Quirico was mentioning the how the financing, training, skills development, and at the same time, dissemination are a combination that is working, is delivering results for, um, for bilateral organizations, for government organizations, but also for the international organizations. I cannot emphasize enough how important financing is, but also the, the, the training, the skills development, uh, and we're not investing enough in dissemination. We're, we're uh, jointly failing to do that. And uh, last year we had the uh, meeting of the multilateral development banks and procurement here in Rome, and IFAD was uh, hosting that meeting. Of the trillions of dollars that we have for procurement and also of the financing that we make available for innovation, we jointly have to recognize that not enough efforts are being put in place so that we reach and we work also with communities, with organizations and uh, startups that are local. We tend to keep working with exactly the same organizations, the same companies that have access to the information that we distribute through traditional channels. Sometimes investments in communications and marketing are seen even by our contributing members as a waste of resources, and they are not, because many of the solutions that we're looking for, the farmers are already, think, you know, this is the main problem that they have. So they think about it all the time. And many of those uh, solutions could be there, but we are not tapping into those uh, solutions because they don't get access to the information. They don't get access to that financing. So in terms of the problems that we have identified and we're trying to address, through um, um, innovation and innovation challenges at IFAD, um, I would say that we are focusing on three main ones. Uh, one is data, access to data and information. We don't have enough data and information to be able to provide uh, farmers with, uh, with solutions that are relevant to them. Second one is access to finance. And the third one is property rights. So based on these three main um, challenges that we have identified, then the solutions that IFAD is uh, providing is also, you know, they're also focusing on, on these uh, three main factors. So I brought today two examples from uh, some uh, innovative uh, use cases that IFAD has. One is in Egypt, and I was uh, very, I was listening attentively to the presentation from the private sector in, in, um, in Egypt, and um, a project also that we are financing in, uh, in Vietnam. The, Without going into the details of the financing and the portion, uh, just to give you an idea, 24% of the financing of these projects in Egypt um, are going to specific um, climate adaptation, and 40% of this uh, is going to in, in Vietnam is going to climate adaptation. The the most important thing here is the is the approach that we have, which is test, learn, and adapt, and making sure that the financing, the training and uh, the support that we're giving to, uh, to the teams through innovation challenges and uh, through the innovations that we have in the program in the, in the programs is, uh, is using this approach of, of learning, making sure that we are implementing that learning in, uh, in our solutions. Uh, next, please. So uh, to give you an example of, um, and with this, I, I will conclude uh, to give you an example of one of the projects of the current IFAT Innovation Challenge. We don't, we're not placing enough enough emphasis on um, on risk mitigation. I was uh, uh, interested also in listening to the presentation before about crop insurance. And more than that, how are we working with farmers? How are we making sure that our approaches 
are addressing really the needs that they have and that we are in continuous consultations with uh, with the, with the smallholder farmers when we are developing designing and developing these innovations so one of the things that we do um at ifat is uh, through tools uh, like lean innovation and behavioral design we establish those conversations continuously i was uh, listening to you michael before about our business case has to make sense also to the farmers mm -hmm. and uh, ensuring through lean innovation we're ensuring that we have that conversation with the farmers, but that conversation doesn't stop there. Doesn't stop. You know, it has to be continuous. It has. You have to be testing your products continuously. You. They have to be. The solutions need to be with them, by them, for them. So that's uh, something that we use in our in our approach uh, continuously. So uh, DG Climate Risk, which is the project that we have um, under the Innovation Challenge, is focusing on that. Is focusing on using geospatial technology, artificial intelligence um, to address risks so that uh, the loan officers have uh, more information um, more, and they can make informed decisions about um, who to give uh, the, the loans to. Um, but farmers also have access to all these technologies so that they, they can increase productivity and build resilience before climate and economic shocks, are, shocks arrive. So that's one uh, of the ways that uh, we use innovation and a uh, lean approach to innovation so that we're working together with a small, uh, small scale far farmers using technology, but making sure that those solutions are being uh, addressing the needs of the small farmers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Gladys, for taking for giving us an overview of EFAD's program in tackling um, scaling up innovation. I think everyone agrees completely that scaling up and financing are very important tasks in our measures to combat climate change. Um, I know that there are so many burning questions. I have myself some burning questions to you, but we run out of time. So I'm encouraging everyone in the room to perhaps have a conversation with Gladys later on. Uh, you're joining us for lunch, right, Gladys? Yeah, yeah so just- Can, can, uh, can I take one minute to uh, suggest a way for exchange of information? Unfortunately, we, we want to make sure that our last speaker would be able to speak. No problem, no problem. Please go ahead. But please uh, do write your- um, your information that you wanted to share on the chat box. And we will sure. Yeah, thank you. So thank you, Gladys, again. And hopefully our members will approach you uh, during lunch. I, I myself would come with some questions. <laughs> and um, lastly, we wanted to invite Dr. Harry Hunter, who is the CEO of Next Gen Tech. Um, very exciting career on robotics and artificial intelligence and intelligent agriculture. I think Dr. Hunter, you can better also introduce more of your work and I give you the floor now. Uh, well, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Well, good morning and um, um, Jackson members, everyone, I'm really excited to be here, honored. Um, so my experience started with uh, robotics and has spanned into artificial intelligence. Some people call me the next Iron Man, some call me the futurist. But uh, to get going, see if I can get the slides up, please. <clears throat> I know we're running out of time. Can we see the slides? Oh, there you go. So what are we talking about today is coming from the, the portion or the, the thought of Adoption, adoption and trust, right? So it's facilitating tech adoption um, by farmers globally by using open source decentralized platforms. Whoa, that's a lot uh, to think about, right? So this is the problem. I have been for the last 10 years talking with small uh, smallholder farms and large uh, farmers and mainly crop farms. I recently started into uh, uh, dairy farmers. And one of the things is Okay, Dr. Hunter. Okay, Mr. Mr. Wise Guy. Um, I don't trust you because I don't trust this technology and I don't trust where's my data and where's this? And it's too expensive. And I said to myself, you're absolutely right. So I started going to rural areas and I started doing some research in Nicaragua, where I'm from Nicaragua, uh, one of the poorest uh, countries in Central America. 
actually in the North America, uh, only second next to uh, Haiti. So one of the first uh, problems of tech adoption, everybody talks about tech, but everybody also knows that tech is very expensive, right? Is lack of access. So one of the things about it is, sure, everybody has a smartphone, right? But let's talk about artificial intelligence. What does it take to have artificial intelligence? Um, what about satellite engineering, right? Uh, down to the farmers. So you're talking about, let's just say, big uh, 400 plus uh, uh, more acres like farms, having smart irrigations that are hundreds of thousands of dollars. And I tell you, because I come from Silicon Valley, I've done the biggest of the fortune corporations in the world of uh, products, and I understand uh, costs really well. So cost is a problem. Lack of access is a problem. Lack of knowledge and skills. We've been talking about, hey, how do we provide this training to the farmers? How do we provide this adoption? And how do we uh, bring in costs together as a whole? It's very difficult because having myself been boots on the grounds with the farmers, going through through the, the, what, how climate change affects them, um, just recently in you know, California, when does California have this type of snow and then the droughts and then the floods? Um, and how can these things be prevented, right? So uh, then there's the area of resistance to change. Uh, none of us like change, let's be honest here, right? When someone tells you you've been doing a routine X amount of time and then they tell you, okay, now you have to change. Now you have to adopt this. Now you have this new responsibilities. And now we're gonna show you about drones. And now we're gonna show you, oh, what? Uh, no, 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 I, I, I don't wanna do this. Even though they're interested, but once you get going with the work, it can get very complex. Uh, next slide. So here we go with trust building, right? With open source decentralized platform. What does this mean? And very short is free. Free, having localized uh, teams, enthusiasts, uh, engineers. I've, I have talked to about 600 and my network is about 300 something of previous uh, Silicon Valley engineers who want to do something new and change. They completely know and accept, yes, we have a problem with climate change. Um, how can we help? Right, but what platforms do we have for communication? So, um, once again, going back to the the part of trust, when you start talking with the farmer, uh, especially smallholder, concerning data, so it's the assurance that farmers are in control of data. Number one, doesn't everybody in this room and around the world you want to know where your data is? That's your personal data. Imagine now going to a farm where we're talking about you hear this globally oh this new hack and this new hack and this new hack you know hacking uh, uh stealing of data and identity theft so what happens when all this data because data is the new gold um gets stolen from 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 people or from these farmers that's the number one concern that a lot of these farmers i speak to work with have is um where's my data and how am i being recorded and where is this going on the internet? And what about artificial intelligence making these fake things, right? So transparency of data pipelines. When it comes to open source, um, for instance, with blockchain, maybe you guys have heard of it, is transparency. It's exactly where your data is. It's stored in a specific ledger, right? And the whole point is that you, one, control your data. You at all times will always know where your data is, right? Two, um, having that, you have, the accessibility of not knowing where your data is and what can you do with that data? How comfortable are you of sharing this data? So I've talked to about half of the farmers, which have been about a thousand in the last maybe the eight years, who have told me, I only want to deal with farmers. I only want to deal with the specific localized or specific region of farmers. And we talk and we share and so forth. So I've been making products, basically very, very low cost products that is not so much in the selling, it's here you go and let's see what happens. Uh, products that build this type of data, uh, data pipelines for these uh, uh, smallholder uh, farmers where they are loving it. They're saying, oh my gosh, so this is not with big tech. So this is not attached to Gmail and this is not attached to this. And this no, sir. No man, this is you guys. You control it. <clears throat> Excuse me. You control it. You deal with it. You see it. 
you're monitoring it, you have full access to everything at all times, right? Next, um, next slide, please. Would you try to be a little bit brief now because we are? Yes, yes, I'm going as fast as I can. Uh, benefits of decentralized platform for farmers. So access to affordable and innovative technology. Uh, once again, greater control, transparency of data, uh, reduced dependency on big tech. Um, it goes back to you don't want to be dependent on massive tech. The problem is once you have one part of technology requires a second part of technology, requires a third part of technology, and it just starts spiraling out of control concerning costs, concerning dependencies, and a lot of farmers just don't like that, right? And if we're talking about adoption and trust, you need to really take it slow. Uh, potential for more sustainable and efficient farming practices, uh, improved market access and profitability. Uh, next slide. So the potential of open source and decentralized uh, platform. Once again, is breaking away from big tech monopolies. Um, the big thing with blockchain, uh, blockchain technology, everybody, you hear blockchain, everybody thinks cryptocurrencies. No, not at all. Uh, blockchain is, is not only tied to cryptocurrency in the financial uh, world, but it's also tied to just how, how data can be stored, how data can be shared, and that the data is controlled and accessed by specific groups um, or who are the people want to share it with. And then working to solve, um, working together to solve global issues in agriculture. Uh, so right now there is five uh, smallholder uh, farmers, uh, crop farmers in Nicaragua in a very rural, very poor area. And through, um, through artificial intelligence uh, and through um, uh, the 3D printing, the, each, the whole budget is $500. $500 for uh, smallholder farms, uh, farmers, five, and it, it ranges from five to seven acres to produce crops. And this has a lot of intelligence of Silicon Valley, for instance, or around the world. Um, and it's a database that they all share to each other. It all deals with phones, right? Because most of everybody has phones. And they're starting to see real real um, possible new solutions that also now start getting into um, them being entrepreneurs for and starting to look for micro loans for instance and this is in a very 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 poor country uh, next slide please so here uh, this is my last slide uh, the future is already here it's just not evenly distributed i think from everything here of uh, my work and what i've been doing it's we really need that trust. The farmers need to trust technology, but technology should not be complex. It should be some abstract, right? And in this little chip, this tiny little chip, very, very low cost, has the intelligence of 100 years of farming in North America, has the intelligence of lessons learned, of disasters, of droughts, of floods, hurricanes, everything to think of. And in this little tiny, tiny chip, once again, we're providing farmers, um, holder, small holder farmers, the intelligence of Einstein without having an Einstein, the intelligence of so much where they're now talking to these systems. Automation is being done for them. Drones, low cost drones, not big tech drones, just low cost drones are going, doing their thing, checking, coming back, and farmers are speaking to, to these things and they're learning just real quick uh, by the insights given. So um, I know we're running out of time, so I'm, that's all for now. Uh, any questions, I'm good to go. I don't know. Thank you very much. Are we on for it? We are pressed for time. I think we had more than an excellent and interesting session about elements related to innovation and technology. And we started with accessibility, scalable affordability, but we had to deeper dive what it, does it mean? Because it's about knowledge sharing. It's about training. It's also about listening to the farmers, the farmers need, what do they need? Not what do we think they need, what do they need? So that comes again back to capacity building. And again, of course, everything what we're now doing this morning is clear. It has to be implemented at the national level. 
and that means we need national programs and not national programs only of governments because they're always mentioned and centered but we need programs for the farmers by the farmers for the private sector by the private sector and it means that it has to be decentralized it needs localization but it needs also adoption to local circumstances and two elements are crucial of course that's the financing as well as making full use of what we have now the digital arena because when we speak about sharing it's enormous enormous possibilities which we have now it's the first glance of what we can do as the alliance for innovation technology and now we turn to the youth the youth is going to take over now and the, the FEO is hosting of course, the Global Alliance for Climate Smart Agriculture. And when I was starting working here in Rome, I was missing in many sessions the youth. And I tried to push, but it's a traditional, sometimes conventional uh, organization. And they were scared about the youth. And when, when I was chairing the council, I said, let's give the floor to the youth. No, you have to be careful because you don't know what they're going to say. I said, I don't want to know what they're going to say because they will enlighten us. They will make sure that it will be lively and they will make sure that we get the messages we needed. And then Kusuki came in and we worked together. And now Kusuki developed the World Food Forum by the youth for the youth. This year in October, we have the third session. And I'm so proud to have them here and sure, be, be assured what you're now going to see is something different than we have seen this morning. Kazuki, mm -hmm. you can sit here, take over. We're glad to listen. Kazuki, mm -hmm. and your team, your floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Hans, um, for giving me your chair, <laughs> and I hope I'm not going to mess up your your um, organization here. And um, um, thank you also, Gaxa, for inviting um, us uh, to to speak today. Um, my name is Kazuki Kitaoka, and I'm the the coordinator of the of the World Food Forum, as um, Hans was mentioning. And um, uh, perhaps before we start with a a group of really distinguished speakers who are. Um, who are here with us today talking about um, uh, the youth is the future. That's the title of this session. Um, uh, let me perhaps uh, remind everybody how important youth is in the policy sphere, as um, uh, Hans said, and we really hope still that the FAO Council perhaps at some point will allow for a youth statement to be read. You, that was a public statement, right? <laughs> Um, but we also um, see, of course, that uh, youth plays a crucial role in all the different spheres of food and agriculture um, in promoting and adopting climate change by uh, um, uh, mitigation, by advocating for action, um, promoting innovation, technology, we have heard it before, providing capacity building training, um, creating entrepreneurship and business opportunities. Um, building collaborations, partnerships, all of these different things um, is where we see a, a crucial role of the dynamism of youth. And um, uh, when I look here around the room, I'm sure we are all very youthful. I'm also hopefully a bit youthful, but um, I'm also not that young. That's why I also asked some of the actually young colleagues um, that are working on um, on issues of youth uh, to join this session, and I'm I'm very glad that at least some are sprinkled in the in the room and um, and joined us here today. And I hope for a bit of an interactive session here. And I hear that you're a very interactive crowd, so very um, looking forward to that. And um, yeah, uh, perhaps a couple of words about the World Food Forum itself. As Hans was um, mentioning about two years, pretty much two years ago, actually in April um, uh, 2021. Um, we came up with this concept of the, the World Food Forum as a platform that did not exist. There was simply no platform for youth to engage with FAO and the Rome-based agencies um, in a um, systematic manner. 
So we proposed at the time, and we had um, uh, uh, political and also um, financial sponsors, um, including Hans in our um, uh, advisory board, um, a platform that would be driven by youth for youth. I'm only a facilitator, no? so I'm just coordinating. It's literally driven by youth and um, supported by a network of partners, but um, really creating these types of spaces that are necessary for youth to get active, to be empowered in the, um, in the different fields of um, the agri-food systems, um, be it in policy through a youth um, uh, 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 assembly that we, uh, th that we created with um, uh, youth policy leaders, in innovation, where we're working with young researchers and scientists, with um, startup um, uh, leaders, um, young startup leaders. Um, of course, here we're working very closely. I see um, also our friends from IFAD, where we are working really closely on innovation in particular, um, but also education, because we saw that um, when it's coming to uh, food and agricultural education in primary, secondary schools is practically um, absent. In tertiary schools, of course, we have then specialization um, uh, happening, but um, we do believe that there should be a much more of a focus also in primary and secondary schools to really bring youth at a much earlier stage to the issues of food and agriculture, to the, food, to, to the solutions that we also have in terms of climate smart agriculture and others. And um, perhaps as a last point here, um, you, we were asking the youth, um, at the World Food Forum, what would you like to have as a theme last year? So we had in 2021, we had a first forum, um, which was online. After that, we asked, what is what what should be your what should be our focus next year when we are coming together and when we are uh, when all of your activities are accumulating in this um, intergenerational moment, uh, which is the flagship that that happens here in Rome, um, with which which is more. Um, of a governation of all of the different things that we are doing. And um, the outcome of that survey was that they wanted to talk about two main major things which was really on their minds. Number one, how can we ensure um, that healthy diets are more globally available? And number two, how can we make sure that that happens within the planetary boundaries that we have? So the, the, the theme of last year was healthy diets, healthy planet. And I think for um, the cl climate smart agriculture um, uh, community, this was really uh, almost a, a silver platter for uh, engaging with youth um, here on, on solutions in um, uh, uh, at, this, uh, at this moment. We had also a, a nice session with um, GAXA during the World Food Forum 2022. Now for this year, um, we asked again and um, one thing was becoming very clear, uh, climate action is becoming even more uh, pertinent and, and urgent for a lot of the youth. So this year's theme um, uh, was uh, designed as agri-food system transformation accelerates climate action. And the idea here of the youth was, how can we make sure that exactly what you're doing with um, climate smart agriculture can accelerate the, the mitigation of climate change, can also accelerate potentially the adaptation. Um, and, um, and, and how can youth help here uh, in, um, uh, in driving, perhaps also supporting, sometimes perhaps also giving new um, uh, uh, initiation uh, um, uh, um, ideas, to, the, um, to, to these important um, topics. I'm sure that is something that um, uh, will resonate with many of you um, as I see this really um, uh, accumulating into um, uh, hopefully a lot of interesting solutions um, that can go to scale at the World Food Forum this year, which is uh, going to be on the 16th to the 20th of October. And I'm sure that everybody is invited, of course, um, uh, that this will, um, uh, be an interesting um, ex inter intergenerational experience to advance on um, uh, this food action, accelerating climate action. Um, I think we have a small video before we are going to the speakers. Um, and uh, I would like to invite 
you to watch this very short. So no, please don't be scared. <laughs> and uh, enjoy. Can yeah, there is no sound at the moment. And I think somebody needs to share the screen. I'm not sure who the technicians are. So, oh, look at me over there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, this is a nice little pause. <laughs> it's a lot of talk. And here we go. Share the screen. Oh, that looks very serious. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, yes, all young people are invited. We have um, a call coming up on Monday for delegations, um, uh, youth delegations and representatives and observers. We know that some countries don't like the idea of delegations, so we also allow youth observers. And um, uh, also partner delegations, youth delegations from our partner organizations and um, and entities that are part of the supporting network of this of the World Food Forum. So uh, we really hope that this year we will have a very broad based um, uh, youth representation at the at the forum and perhaps also swapping over to the CFS. Now, with that, we are coming to the uh, to uh, four fantastic speakers um, uh, in this section on youth is the future. Uh, I would argue actually youth probably already is leading at the moment, so perhaps it's also the present. So, um, but yeah, in the future for sure is going to be, uh, they, will, they will shape our future. And um, uh, first I have here um, Roberta Jana, um, the senior advisor of the Italian Ministry for the Environment and Energy Security. Um, youth for climate and uh, yep. yes, I give you the floor. Thank you very much and uh, good morning everyone. Uh, thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to present uh, the Youth for Climate Initiative. I will be sharing the presentation with my colleague Emanuela Vignola as well from the Ministry of Environment and Energy Security of Italy. 
and um, we'll be glad, of course, to answer any question over lunch time. So it will be very, uh, very brief and short with the presentation. Um, U for Climate uh, is a global initiative co-led by the Italian government and the UNDP, formally launched uh, last year in May and um, developed by uh, young people, youth-led organizations and uh, strategic partners, including uh, um, Connect for Climate, which is a communication program on climate change of the World Bank. And um, it started with a standalone event, uh, which took place uh, in Milan, in Italy, during uh, uh, the pre-COP 26 uh, in 2021. And um, it was um, taught uh, as a... Uh, let's say one shot event uh, to allow young people on the stage uh, um, to present their ideas and instances uh, uh, to the ministers uh, coming to attend the pre-COP. And uh, actually it was uh, uh, such a powerful uh, and successful event uh, that it was decided uh, um, to, uh, to transform it into a permanent initiative and uh, in partnership uh, with the United Nations. So this is where uh, it started. Uh, since uh, the first event in Milan, we had a um, second event in New York, and this year um, it will be in Rome. Um, the, the initiative aims to build around uh, the, the instances and the proposals made uh, by the young people uh, in the Youth for Climate Manifesto, which is the uh, document developed by young people uh, uh, in the first event in Milan, but always uh, um, growing and uh, um, of course uh, to um, boost uh, youth action, youth climate action uh, and uh, provide uh, um, support uh, to young people in developing uh, uh, new and innovative solutions to tackle climate change and to enhance young people in participating more and more uh, at, uh, at the international level uh, in uh, uh, dialogues uh, with governments uh, and uh, have a real uh, um, influence uh, on the international processes. Um, so the next uh, slide, please. If not, I go on and wait. Okay, thank you. Uh, the core components of the initiative uh, are the flagship event, uh, uh, the Knowledge Hub, which is a web platform, uh, and the solutions. The flagship event, uh, as I said, the first one took place in Milan, the second in New York. This year, uh, we will have uh, the event uh, uh, hosted in, uh, in Rome, and it will be back-to-back -back with the World Food Forum in order to maximize uh, um, youth participation and, and exchanges and giving them the, the possibility um, uh, to attend and uh, of course the several the, the many events of the youth uh, the world food forum we will invite uh, um 150 young people from all over the world shortlisted from the over 1200 um, project proposals we received and the aim of uh, the event will be to award uh, uh, the best uh, project proposals uh, um, with, uh, with funds to be uh, concretely implemented. Um, we also developed uh, a web platform, uh, which is um, uh, growing and growing uh, now with more uh, uh, 5,000 participants. Uh, and uh, it is um, meant to be a virtual space where young people can uh, uh, exchange ideas, get to know each other, uh, and also receive uh, information on what is happening at the international level, mainly on climate change related issues, but also uh, on uh, sustainable development and the SDGs overall. And, um, um, receive uh, uh, materials uh, uh, to, to build their capacities on, on climate change. And the third component of the initiative is uh, composed by the solutions. Um, and I will give the floor to my colleague Emanuela to explain them better. Okay. Good morning, everyone. My name is Emanuela. Uh, thank you for having us today and for giving the opportunity to share with you the you for climate initiative. If you can uh, just uh, go to the next slide. 
The call for solutions uh, were designed to support and implement uh, youth-led projects uh, and activities. Uh, the first call for solution was launched last September in New York at the end of the flagship event. Uh, it was closed uh, at the end of March, uh, and we received quite an impressive number of uh, applications uh, since it, it was the first time that we launched this type of initiative. Uh, we were quite uh, uh, shocked by the amount of uh, 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 applications, uh, but it means that young people uh, uh, want to uh, to uh, be involved, to have a say, and to be part uh, of the uh, solution. Um, the uh, Youth for Climate Solutions is based uh, on the UNDP facility, but the entire content of the activities that have been designed with young people during the past two years. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the call for solutions uh, uh, is uh, addressed to young people aged between uh, uh, 18 and 29 uh, that are uh, a single, as a single individual, but also a representative of an NGO or private sector. The themes that were being, uh, that were identified for this year are urban sustainability, energy, food and agriculture, and education. And particularly on food and agriculture, we must say that we have received a very interesting proposals uh, and we see a lot of synergies uh, with the GAXA and I think that we can explore uh, how to better synergize uh, our uh, uh, inputs uh, and our resources uh, to get the maximum uh, of uh, our both uh, initiatives. Next slide please. Mm, so far, we have uh, also 14 partners uh, in order to uh, build uh, cross-generational partnerships. Uh, these partners are, are important uh, because they are uh, providing young people uh, not only uh, financial resources, but especially mentoring activities and also all the support that uh, they would uh, will need, would have needed to uh, um, uh, put together uh, the uh, proposal. Again, uh, the, the type of partnerships uh, are very uh, wide, so we can collaborate also in terms of uh, activities uh, uh, and uh, also uh, we can host uh, on our um, virtual platform uh, uh, workshops uh, and activities that can be used to share information, to disseminate uh, uh, the best practice uh, and uh, lesson learned. Next slide, please. Um, the shortlisted candidate, long-listed candidate uh, will be invited to the flagship uh, event in Rome and the selection committee will then uh, identify shortlisted candidate that will receive an award uh, up to 20,000 US dollar and uh, the selection committee uh, is made by uh, of uh, Italian Ministry of the Environment, a representative of UNDP, uh, but also our partners and of course uh, young people that uh, have been involved uh, in the uh, advisory committee, which is the body that uh, uh, support us uh, in the creation and design of the flagship events uh, and uh, all the other activities that characterize our uh, initiative. Next slide, please. The um, evaluation criteria for the projects uh, are quite uh, uh, huge in terms of that because we want to uh, make sure that the projects have also an impact uh, in the community that are designed for and uh, will reflect uh, the um, objectives of the Paris Agreement, but also the SDG, um, uh, the, uh, the SDGs. Uh, uh, therefore, uh, they are shaped uh, we, with uh, the uh, one of the uh, selection criteria is also the degree of the innovation in terms of uh, innovation for the community where the project is developed, but also replicability, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the effectiveness of the budget, the impacts on the environment, particularly, as I said, with the SDGs and um, uh, uh, climate challenges, impact on the community, and uh, potential, potential of uh, gender equality. Next slide, please. 
We are very active on the social media. As you can see, we can count of a number of uh, uh, partners, uh, particularly UNDP and Connect for Climate. And uh, since last year, we, uh, we registered 1 billion interactions uh, under the hashtag uh, you for climate So please make sure to follow us and uh, to engage with our activities uh, on the platforms uh, and uh, everywhere. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This is really an exciting, exciting platform that you're building up. It's really interesting. And uh, we should also talk after this session, because I think there's really a lot that um, uh, we could, I think, uh, learn from each other and also benefit um, uh, youth and youth uh, participation. But um, I open the floor for any comments or questions that are immediate and burning. Otherwise, we can go to the next speaker. I see none at this point. I'm sure there are a lot of questions about this fantastic product project. Um, but uh, we um, move to um, our next speaker, um, uh, Divine Tiokam, um, the founder of uh, the Climate Smart Agriculture Youth Network. Um, and uh, I believe he has spoken already before um, uh, at the opening, but um, uh, and it's online if I'm not completely mistaken. So um, Divine, great to see you and um, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect, thank you very much indeed. I, I, I mean, um, I heard colleagues saying that uh, youth for future generation, I would like to echo here that youth are the present and not the future. So um, they need to be capacitated right now not tomorrow, right now, as I speak right now. So um, we want to say that at the level of CSYN, we've actually done a lot of work in the past 10 years, uh, of most 10 years, but next year we're gonna be celebrating our 10th anniversary. And I'm very, very happy to say here that, uh, of course, I feel at home because it's our model, GAPSA organizing this framework of uh, annual forum. To go straight to the point, in the morning I shared, uh, earlier on, earlier than this, I shared the, Achievements at the level of CSY. I heard uh, the coordinator for uh, World Food Forum, Kazuki, saying that uh, we need to engage, we need to engage young people. And we've been doing that for the past six months. We've been doing that already. I have remarkable results and tangible results. It's for this reason we have over 11, 11 primary and high schools already engaged in climate smart practices right at the basic level. And I wouldn't end there, we equally have the nursery. Nursery children below three years have been planting trees here in Cameroon and other countries. So I want to say um, that gap has been met by CSYM. The second slide, please. The second slide, anyway, the second slide actually shows um, uh, the, the virtual academy uh, e-learning platform that was launched uh, a few weeks ago, where, of course, Ambassador Hans right there and other, we had over three or four ambassadors present. And this was just to show the commitments or to recall the commitments of policy makers, of diplomats, of stakeholders in e-learning education. Because one of the outcomes of COVID, I always say COVID had two different uh, thresholds. One, where poverty line 1.25 US dollar mark was actually dropped. You know, a lot of it actually in the sense that a lot of people went to poverty, went to poverty again due to COVID. But again, the positive message is that, or the good news is that, with this framework, we're able to think out of the box, bringing education much more at the e frame, e learning framework, and that's why CSYN is very, very happy to say that we have an e learning platform right now whereby we are accommodating over 120 interns across 50 or 45 centers of excellence across the globe, where within that framework, we have facilitators who are experts in their various uh, thematic areas, big climate change, big agro food system, big, um, you know, uh, t -bird, you know, big, uh, building the capacity of the unschooled or informal education. We've done that already, and we're very, very happy to say that. And of course, we're heading towards the, uh, uh, I, I, ambition, ambition summit and equal the SDG summit in September, 
We've already started using this framework to ensure that we organize as massive dialogues on SDGs as much as possible. Yeah, uh, this framework, I'm sorry, the slides are not going on, I don't know why, but I think this presentation was just to show you all that young people are already doing things. We have a, we have a, port, we have a portal for the children, we have a portal for the youth, we have a portal for the women, and we have a portal for experts in the various domains. So I'm so, so happy. Now, I want to equally echo here. Training young people is good, but now we've been able to come up with a framework of uh, exchange program, the Climate Smart Agriculture Education Exchange Program, where there is a, a, a student to student mobility, student to lecturer mobility, and researcher to researcher mobility, so that they can benchmark their ideas, their knowledge sharing, they can equally build their capacity themselves. Because it has been proven that youth to youth is better off than youth to lecturer capacity building. So this mentorship is actually going on. We are so happy to say that here. And of course, looking at the theme um, of the upcoming World Food Forum, where we're actually making sure that addressing the, the, the aspect of agri food system, how do we transform it? I want to say here that young people, youth are the enablers of transforming the broken agri food system towards achieving SDG one and SDG two. We are actually really, really important uh, components of the SDGs because with hunger, we cannot go to school. With hunger, we cannot be talking of environmental sustainability. We cannot be talking about gender parity, gender equality or social protection. So we felt that those two SDGs are key components on ensuring that we achieve the SDGs by 2030. Now, of course, without leaving behind the agenda 2063 for the African Union. The last point I want to mark here, I want to, I want to share here before I hand over to you, uh, my brother, Kaz, is that um, CSYN right now, we are very, 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 very happy to collaborate, of course. We are one of the uh, coalition members of the World Food Forum. And we are here to announce publicly that we are in 10 years next year, 10 years, and uh, we'll be joining efforts, of course, with all the room-based agencies and equal development partners to make this event a remarkable one. We are looking forward to having this anniversary on the continent of Africa, because we all know that Africa is a continent of the future. In Africa, it still has 65% arable land on use, which means that it has not been tapped. We have African young people who have not yet uh, explored, who have not yet understood that our culture is the way to go. But right now, they're at the front line. And that's why right from primary school, we've been able to set up what we call climate smart, climate smart our culture centers of excellence. So without the centers of excellence, we are not sure we're going to go anywhere. Thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Kazi. Thank you, Kazi. Thank you, Thank you so much, Divine, and um, uh, I, I really hope we will um, meet in person this year at the World Food Forum in Rome. Um, but I open the floor again also for any immediate burning questions or comments or remarks, if there are any. Ado, yes? No. <laughs> <That was not. laughs> um, otherwise, we are moving on to our next um, uh, esteemed speaker, um, Jessica. Muzam Hindo, the um, CSA coordinator from Zimbabwe. Um, and uh, over to you. Jessica is online. No, yes, here I'm we here. Go. Thank oh you gosh. so much. Yes. Yes. Can Sorry. you hear me? <laughs> Can you hear me now? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's good to be here. I remember in 2021, uh, we participated virtually. So I'm so happy to meet all of you today. Um, I'm from Zimbabwe, and I'm representing the Zimbabwean Climate Smart Agriculture Alliance, and um, I'm here for the young people. So I'm going to give an overview of climate smart agriculture in Zimbabwe. Uh, as the government of Zimbabwe has established many CSA in in initiatives, which are enabling policies that help uh, CSA. Uh, tracing back uh, back before, um, I think 10 years ago, uh, the NGOs were the uh, custodians of the CSA programs. The government were not uh, at the forefront of running the CSA, but now they have adopted it and they are trying to make uh, policies which enable us as youth to participate mm -hmm. and also be more involved in uh, CSA. So in 2018, the government of Zimbabwe uh, 
uh, establish a manual for agriculture, it, which was launched by the president of Zimbabwe. And its custodian is the Grain Impact Trust. And in this uh, manual, it clearly states uh, uh, what has to be done in order to spearhead CSA. Uh, in also in 2021, the um, uh, government also tried to establish, they came up with an idea of creating a regional college for CSA. And uh, this uh, uh, idea was endorsed by the government and it's um, under a public-private partnership with the Green Impact Trust and the French Development Agents. Uh, in, um, it also established a framework uh, which ran from 2018 up until 2028 under the Ministry of Lands, uh, Agriculture, Water, Climate, and Rural Settlement. And in this uh, framework, it clearly states uh, the gender roles, youth, uh, importance of ICT, and a uh, lot of uh, uh, many initiatives which are to be done. Uh, we have actually uh, have key, key milestones, especially with the regional college, uh, uh, which is to be established. And uh, the, there was an invitation of the public pri private partnership to establish this uh, uh, college. And uh, so far, the Ministry of Lands in the Department of Livestock have endorsed it. And they are also now uh, helping us uh, establish uh, with drought tolerant and crop varieties, which you know as Zimbabwe is an agriculture country and um, they, we mainly depend on agriculture. So due to climate change, we've noted that uh, there's decrease in food security. So new technologies uh, are needed for drought resist resilient crops so that we can achieve food security. Um, we have also uh, noted that uh, we have the education, the farming extension in industry uh, uh, sequence. So it, in education sector, the uh, government of Zimbabwe has established what we call education 5.0, where there is teaching, research, community engagement, innovation, and industrialization. Um, this is to promote climate smart agriculture along the value chain. And uh, we've noted that uh, in our government, uh, agriculture is now a mandatory course from the infant uh, grade up until the university. The, no one is selecting that you want to be in agriculture. You have a basic understanding of agriculture from at a young age, probably at five years, they are now learning agriculture. It's mandatory. Well, I've also seen that um, youth now have a perspective of what is called uh, climate smart agriculture. And uh, as you can see, everyone is saying that the youth voice uh, is important um, and we are the majority. But here present, I, I'll be representing the majority of the youth but there is a group that is mainly that that is lacking to be represented. If you look at the youth, we have different types of youth. We have two categories: we have urban youth and rural youth. As you can see, for urban youth, they have access to resources. They are on social media. They are. Um, uh, they can learn more like the, what was uh, Divine talking about, programs, trainings uh, on, on internet and virtually, but there's this group that I really need to talk about, which is the rural youth, which does not have access to these, uh, to these programs, but they are the ones at the center of farming. I am here talking, but they are there in the field. So I think um, there is need of uh, scaling up our initiative to the rural youth. Uh, my perspective is we need to have focal points in our countries so that they there are youth who will be on the ground working with youth, farmers, 
uh, or youth lead farmers so that whatever we are learning from our universities, from our, um, from our organization is going out there into the rural uh, community. Uh, from where I come from in Zimbabwe, uh, some areas don't even have internet connectivities. Uh, these people are lacking because they, they are lacking of it on information. If we just think that we are going to establish uh, uh, policies, training programs to cater for the urban uh, youth, then it means we are lacking, uh, uh, we are failing the rural youth. If there are no people who are going to be in the field for them, then they are going to be lacking out. So to be more specific, rural youth are the best and that the particular group which are to be included because they are on the ground and they're the, the ones who are mainly affected by climate change because they rely mainly on agriculture. Unlike uh, people in, uh, in urban, when they feel that they don't want to, uh, to farm, they can go and shop, buy, but for them, they have no other uh, opportunity or way to have a living. So uh, there should be efforts to involve these youth so that they have uh, the capacity to be equal with the ones in, in the urban areas. So in, um, as you can see, there is a promotion of uh, innovation and industri industrialization. But when you are in the rural, you probably have a very good uh, idea, but you do not know who to scale up your, or who to take your idea to the top level. And these youth are lacking, uh, on opportunities. So I think um, it's for, for students who are in the university, the youths that are in university, they have a very good opportunity to uh, maneuver in a job career. But for those that are in the field, there's lack of, uh, there's uh, employment rate is uh, increasing lack of employment, but they have their land. Uh, in Zimbabwe, it's difficult to acquire land when you are young people, but we know that we, we have our inherited uh, family land where we can actually uh, try to help them so that they can actually utilize their warm rural lands. I, uh, the, the lands are, are pretty big so that they can actually practice climate smart agriculture. Uh, we have what we call a uh, Young Farmers Association. But as you can see, mainly young farmers association are those usually that have the opportunity, like uh, I have the opportunity to be here. I can have uh, links with other organization and they can take me in. But for those rural youth who are going to help them, who are going to scale up their idea, who are going to help them with the initiatives that they have. So um, the key message for me today, I'm advocating for the rural youth. I think there is need to help these, that, that certain type of group. There's need for capacity building because uh, some of them are already in the farming, but they have lack of market. There's need for linkages and synergies between a farmer and the market. There's also need to uh, access to opportunities. It doesn't mean that when you do, you do not have um, formal academic um, uh, background, you are not producing well. So you are not supposed to have other opportunities which uh, academic sectors can have. I think um, uh, me being here as GAXA can facilitate and help us with this uh, certain type of group by creating synergies uh, and maybe working with uh, universities because now because of the education 5.0 we are mainly talking about we also emphasizing on research innovation and industrialization but when we work with the universities it means that during the research time they can go out there and teach the rural farmers, they should be on the ground with the farmers, with the youth on the farmers. Um, usually in Zimbabwe, we have in my native uh, language, we have what we call uh, Zundera Mambo. And uh, this is um, an initiative where the traditional village had calls uh, 
all farmers in the village, they meet, they discuss what's affecting uh, the agriculture sector, their problems, what they are looking for. So I think we can actually have this uh, initiative where we can work with uh, uh, our village herd so that they, they link up with, with uh, farmers, link up with young farmers, and then we start to help them with uh, initiatives. And uh, we need to look at these youth in the national programs so that they come up with uh, uh, innovative hub and in, with their indigenous knowledge, other than saying we need data from university, a published paper, because if you do that, we are lacking the youth. We are lacking, and this, this group is the majority of group which are out there. So I think um, my key message today is to let us look out for the rural youth. Let's not just have uh, policies or programs which cater for the, um, for the youth that are privileged. There are brilliant people out there. I'm so lucky to be here but someone who might be very brighter than me and with a lot of ideas, who is a farmer is missing out on these opportunities. Thank you, over to you. Thank, thank you so much and um, uh, very true. I think um, uh, rural youth, um, uh, marginalized youth, um, uh, but also indigenous youth, we have not talked about um, uh, this group, are um, uh, definitely um, uh, uh, groups that um, uh, have specific needs as well and also specific um, uh, difficulties in, in, in view of their marginalization in, um, in, in the discussions that we have um, uh, on both policy but also in the innovation space. I saw, um, thank you so much for, for uh, giving us this fantastic example from Zimbabwe, what you're doing there. Um, we hope that we can showcase perhaps also the, your work at the World Food Forum, as um, we have some space for country ex, uh, uh, country case studies there. Um, we have also some local chapters on um, youth in food and agriculture opening up in different countries. So uh, I'm sure that this could be a very interesting um, uh, a case for, for many to be inspired by and learn from. Um, and uh, yeah. Uh, yes, we have a hand up, which is great. And we have two hands up, the three hands up. You have inspired, <laughs> Jessica. That's great to see. Um, perhaps go first to um, Dr. Rajit Nassim uh, online from Pakistan and then um, Sir here in the, in the audience. But over to you, um, uh, Dr. Nassim. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, am I audible? Yes, we, we hear you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, the organizer. Uh, thank you very much for putting in. Uh, I, uh, this is Dr. Uh, I am working as a uh, associate professor and director in the International Center for Climate Change, Food Security and Sustainability over here in the Islam University of Bahá'u'lláh, Pakistan. And also, we are the members of GAXA. Uh, last year, we become the uh, member. And I was very much interested to participate physically, but due to some reasons, I think uh, the GAXA fa facilitation center might have a lot of, uh, you can say, things that uh, I was unable to do, uh, make it uh, to be phys present physically. But overall, uh, uh, I do endorse Jessica that uh, we have to uh, have the provide the opportunities to young uh, researchers, young youth, especially students, and also we have to keep the uh, you can say opportunities, especially for least developed areas and as well as least developed uh, you can say uh, countries as well. So, so we have the consortium uh, on climate change, uh, sustainability, and conservation over here in Pakistan in which more than 80 universities, research organizations, uh, private sector industries and uh, different types of NGOs are working on climate change, climate smart agriculture are uh, um, with, our, with us uh, on board. And uh, we are uh, 
really interested to have some practical uh, implementation of all the policies, uh, especially uh, funding opportunities that we have to Gaksa and from this platform, I would request to, um, you can say, uh, put all the, you can say, much of the, uh, you can say, opportunities should be allotted for the least developed areas, universities, and because uh, I do really uh, agree with the Jessica comments that we okay, have to wrap up perhaps your your comment and um, and the question to the to the panel that would be great fantastic thank you thank you um, just uh, I, I will I will endorse the Jessica that we have to provide the opportunities to the uh, least developed universities and least developed you can say rural youth so this is all about from I said thank you very much. Thank you very much. I don't know, Jessica, if you want to um, respond, or perhaps we go to some of the comments that were here in the room, and then um, uh, a round of uh, response at that point. I think, I think, yes, yeah, sir, you had um, your hand up. Also, your neighbor, I think, had the hand up. I don't know who was first, but I saw a lot of hands coming up. So that was great. Great to see. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm Kaganga Jun from Uganda. And I'm a smallholder farmer. Uh, first of all, I'm just going, I'm sorry, I'm just giving the, the, the general comment because I came late and I'm sorry, for, I, I'm sorry for that. But at least I have struggled and come here and I thank the organizers because from the plane to here, therefore, that's why sometimes you see me dozing. Uh, having said so, I'm commenting on innovation and, and technology. Uh, we have a problem. I am a farmer and I have all that experience and I've been working with my fellow farmers. But when we talk about innovation, we, uh, we talk, we don't talk much about local innovations and also using indigenous knowledge. And in most, in most cases, we just jump on uh, scientific innovations. Therefore, if we don't change that, uh, way how we look at things and we, we don't promote these local innovation i'm a specialist in promoting local innovation and they have worked in uganda that's why i stick to that then uh about the use also we have also a problem with the with the use we are to talking about the use but we want to, 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 to the use to be inspired and to be interested in farming when they have grown up, when they are in the universities, when they have finished the, uh, studies. But for me, I, uh, this is my experience. I grew in the hand of my grandmother because my mother died when at the age of two in a very poor family. But because uh, my grandmother was a farmer, I took that inspiration of farming and the way how they were farming was really fantastic. Therefore, I am, I, I'm, I'm, I'm requesting that we start these small children uh, when they are young. And even you people from developed countries, you can do it because I have a, co a colleague in, in, in German, but they have a, a garden like this. When they, 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 they admire about that small garden, but uh, that is, that's one, because of time, I'm just in, in a brief. Then thirdly, this has, I, I have been talking about this in, in our country, in Uganda, that uh, you, you people, especially people at the high level, you have left farming to the poor and vulnerable. Whereas without food, you cannot also survive. Therefore, that's why now, uh, agriculture, the, the farming has become as business as usual. We are talking about how are we promoting farming, how are we promoting agriculture. Uh, farmers put so a lot of billions and billions of money. If I did the same thing, and so many other agencies, but there is no change, especially for the poor. Last but not least, I would also request, as we are addressing uh, agriculture or farming, that uh, farming in the developed countries has a, 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 a differ a bit with farming in, a, in a developing countries or less developed countries. Because for, for some, for, for you people in developed countries, you have the, a lot of incentive, you have a lot of support. Now, for example, I'm also, uh, when I have been looking at it, I have been following uh, Italy, Netherlands, Belgium, 
the way how they are supporting farming, because maybe they have the resources or I don't know, but at a high tech. Therefore, uh, when we are looking at farming, if we want to be successful, we should also try to look how is the farming in the developed countries? How is the farming in the, in the, in the, in the develop, developed countries or developing countries? And what can we do? And it is good you have invited us people at the grassroots to tell you, because some, they have been inviting me to different, to different meeting at a national, at, the, at a, a higher level. That's, what my, that's my contribution. Thank you, thank you so much. Sir, over to you. So my comments build exactly on that point, that as we talk about climate change, as we talk about agriculture, as we talk about solutions that we can be delivering, I think we have to be sensitive to the fact that it's not monolithic. Agriculture is a very, very diverse industry, big, small, variety of products that are grown, variety of capacities to produce. And in our messaging, I think it's really important to be talking about opportunities as opposed to just problems. I heard an opportunity message there that with the right support, developing countries can lift up and become climate smart and help themselves and help the world. And we can have that same type of example everywhere. So for the passion in the room, and I really appreciate the youth coming forward and being involved, I'd urge you to reflect a little bit about the messaging because the message of hope and the message of positive successes is a critically important part of the overall message. And when, and it might just be me, but when I listened and saw that video, my takeaway was it's all broken. I didn't see the successes that are already coming. And when you look at the people in this room, we know that the industry isn't perfect, but there is so much hope and progress and commitment to go forward. And with the help of youth, boy, we can accomplish anything. So I think message is important and communicating ongoing progress in the context of a challenge is something to pay attention to and reflect upon. So thank you. Thank you very much for um, for this comment. Yes, um, over to you. Hello, I'm Margaret Vatana again from Thailand. Uh, very exciting uh, listening to particularly to Zimbabwe. Uh, I, I, but curios, curiosity wise, how do you bring the youth in the policy making process? Uh, I am from the public sector. Uh, I'm, I have a perspective from the private sector, and so how 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 do you bring the the how youth are heard in policy making process of the government? Uh, how it become legislative, and also for example, uh, I may share our policies for the youth in Thailand. Uh, when the climate smart agriculture was uh, introduced, everybody's getting to be smart, right? So we have, uh, under the ministry, we have this young smart officer. Yes. And also now uh, we have this smart young farmers. And these are being uh, managed by the Ministry of Agriculture, by the Department of Agricultural Extension. And so, and so, uh, I'm just uh, curious whether your program is being uh, mainstreamed in the public sector so that the uh, policy could could support the youth in in the rural community. Because I, as I understood that you are from the non-government organization, and I'm from the public sector, and so how how do we link, and how could GATSA? help bridge that 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 uh, uh, linkage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do I see, yes, one more. And I think with that, then we go, oh, two more. 
Yes, over to you, sir. Hi, hello. Uh, I'm Rajiv, Rajiv Pandey from uh, India. And uh, I would like to share uh, uh, how we got into Climate Smart Agriculture and uh, w what is the status today. So uh, it's a uh, small story. Uh, and uh, I, I understand, uh, you know, talking about food and, you know, at the time of lunch, uh, it's a bit difficult for everyone. But uh, uh, so uh, I was part of this anti-trafficking project in uh, India, in uh, Andhra Pradesh in 2006-07 where I realized that, uh, you know, uh, talking about anti-trafficking uh, is not the only uh, thing which, uh, which could have been done there. Uh, so I realized that, uh, you know, we need to uh, get into the uh, root cause of the problem. And uh, we realized that uh, that region is, you know, rain deficient and uh, uh, there is very little rainfall. And because of which a lot of uh, uh, human trafficking at the same time, you know, migration was also happening to the nearby towns and the, uh, you know, metropolitan cities. So uh, when uh, I discussed it with the local community there, uh, we realized that, you know, uh, people are migrating because there is no food. So uh, food was the root cause and uh, no food uh, and uh, no work. And uh, that's why all the uh, problem was happening. So uh, we started working on it and uh, we realized that, you know, uh, millets are, are suitable for that region because it takes very little water to grow and very little input cost. So no chemical input uh, in the crop and uh, uh, farmers can, you know, earn uh, a good amount of money from that. So, and we also realized that uh, the last successful crop was in uh, 1985 they started growing groundnuts. So uh, we started with fa five farmers and uh, today we have more than 10,000 farmers with us who are growing millets and successfully growing millets. So uh, we did, uh, you know, meeting with farmers and uh, training and capacity building. And we also did uh, a revival of, you know, old uh, and ancient tools which were used for, uh, you know, uh, weeding and other things. We also created a seed bank there. And uh, we, uh, when we realized that uh, farmers have started growing and uh, there is no uh, you know, processing centers and markets, so we uh, motivated youth there, local youths, uh, to set up the processing plants. So uh, that was on a, on a, uh, you know, in involving the private sector there. So uh, uh, they started, uh, you know, doing the uh, primary processing. And uh, after that, uh, we started uh, linking them with the market. But uh, the market was not mature for uh, millets. So uh, then we, uh, in 2016, we set up this uh, uh, company, uh, Millets for Health, which started marketing uh, it with the uh, end user, so the consumers. So uh, we created a brand and then, the, uh, you know, uh, we started working with, uh, you know, end users and we uh, also did uh, training on how to cook with millets. So that created the entire value chain of the millets. And uh, today, uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, people who are, uh, you know, using millets in India and abroad. Uh, we also focused on local consumption uh, within farmer communities and uh, uh, good food ingredients for the urban poor as well. So, uh, because uh, we realized that, you know, the urban poor uh, is taking the hit uh, and uh, they don't have a very good health index. So, uh, we started working with them. Uh, we launched a project called uh, Ghar Ghar Potion, uh, which is a nutrition at every household. So we started working with mothers, you know, training them on uh, innovative recipes. And uh, so uh, our, our initiative is, you know, from farm to tummy. So we, uh, we en entered into every, each and every value chain of the uh, ecosystem. And that's why we realized that, you know, uh, it's important to, uh, you know, work at each and every, uh, you know, uh, segment. So, uh, that is all from my side. And uh, at last, you know, we also believe in, you know, farmers don't need our sympathy. They need our respect and we owe them that respect.
Thank, thank you so much, sir. And um, we have one last question here, and then we go back to the speakers from before, but yeah. yeah thank you sir. very much. So I'm Francesco from SRI 2030, which is a new member of DAXA. We are uh, an organization that acts as a facilitator and connector among the um, stakeholders of the rise of sectors. And uh, we have a global approach um, as we coordinate a network in over 60 countries, but we have a narrow focus on one specific agroecological and climate smart approach, which is the system of rice intensification. So I, um, I wanted to ask Jessica um, about what actually uh, was dri driving the, um, the commitment of Zimbabwean government toward uh, climate smart agriculture. But before that, I also would like to, to reflect a moment on, on the fact that we are stating how country-led um, transition, country-led actions are key to achieve transition. And this connects very well with what was mentioned by our colleague from uh, IFAD, Gladi Morales, about the lack of, in, of, on, of investment on dissemination as well as the engagement with country-based organization to achieve what Christina Kiriko was mentioning about merging technologies, dissemination, and training. Yeah, sorry. Um, so I think today we are in an optimal situation because we cannot really be satisfied with uh, COP recognizing more and more the role of agriculture, but we would like countries to commit more in their national retirement contribution uh, with more like bold uh, commitment to implement climate smart agriculture. So I, I said today is a good moment because uh, NDCs are being reviewing, reviewed and by 2025, they should be uh, submitted again. So I also would like to know as a new member of GAXA, um, if GAXA is planning to, to, to work together with national government and with all the stakeholders, private sector, public sector, uh, who is needed to contribute to this transition to actually support countries in uh, committing with, in uh, implementing climate smart agriculture in their NDCs, as well as with the implementation phase of the, their NDCs. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And um, with that, uh, I hand over to Jessica perhaps first, and then also the other uh, speakers for any um, comments and responses. Uh, Jessica, over to you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I would like to answer you first. Uh, when you say what uh, uh, moved the government of Zimbabwe to adopt the CSA strategy, uh, our country is an agriculture country. And uh, due to um, climate change, we have, have, we have been having a lot of uh, drought periods era. But uh, with the NGOs coming in, they were teaching, they were bringing in technology on how to uh, use uh, conservation agriculture. And uh, from that, we discovered that the government discovered that there were a lot of success stories, especially in region um, four and five in Zimbabwe. Uh, you can't grow maize in that area. But uh, through conservation agriculture, when we were told that you have to till okay. the minimum tillage, cover crops, so, uh, moisture cons converse, uh, conservation, we noticed that those areas were now uh, harvesting uh, more than they used to do. So because of that, the government saw a lot of success stories. Uh, in 2013, I was at um, International Crop Institute for the uh, ICRISAT, um, would uh, uh, travel to different regions as, uh, assessing uh, the project which were implemented. And because uh, when an NGO enters a country, it doesn't work on its standalone, it also works with extension officers. And these extension officers will go back and report the success stories that are happening in the country. That's why the government of Zimbabwe was motivated to adopt this new technology. And now they are now also embracing agroecology, uh, regenerative farming. They have now, and uh, with uh, conservation agriculture in our native language, they call it fumvuza. So when you tell someone that we are doing fumvuza, that person is, um, 
likely to uh, adopt it more because it's in the language that he or she thinks uh, is very good for her. It doesn't think that someone is coming and giving me this that I don't know, but they feel like they are the owners of the initiative. I answered, thank you. Yes, uh, yeah, and um, to your question, um, our government has a minister of youth so when we have a minister of youth, we can register our youth uh, organizations through that. So when you register your organization, it's easier for you to lob in uh, ideas, uh, uh, what you want, what you think would want. Uh, through that ministry and we get represented through that ministry and our minister of uh, agriculture lands agriculture uh, water and climate and rural settlement have actually also have a youth desk where you can go and uh, launch if it's a problem if it's help if it's need and at least you'll be helped in the language you have got different language you'll be helped in the language that you feel best that you you can know so for government to appreciate that when you work with uh, youth organizations that are registered, you will be called when there are meetings, when they are pol for policy making. I remember in uh, 2021, uh, the Glasgow COP, uh, we uh, there was a youth um, group, Africa Youth Initiative for Climate Change. It uh, traveled the whole country. Uh, engaging youth, asking what youth needs to be represented at the COP, and we made a one document which was presented at COP uh, at Glasgow. Thank you so much. Um, I'm looking at the other um, uh, presenters, if there's any um, comments or responses from their side at this point. Any other burning questions? Otherwise, um, I know that um, there are only two more um, elements that are holding you from going to lunch. Um, and uh, it is promised, it's very short. Um, this is going to be led and also entirely, it was entirely done. I was not involved in um, in any of the, by um, the young colleagues, um, Anna and Leticia who are sitting next to me. And before we are going to that, um, we have uh, one um, uh, extraordinary um, example of um, how to, um, perhaps also change a bit the communication we do with youth. Um, uh, as um, I think I heard before, we have great solutions out there. What if, imagine what we could do if we could um, motivate youth to get on board, work with us on um, make and make this um, happen. So uh, this um, particular individual um, uh, is uh, doing that. He's communicating um, with a completely different way. He's a young 20 year old poet uh, who has last year at the World Food Forum been um, giving um, his uh, um, a poem for the um, for the World Food Forum and um, uh, he's from uh, Lagos, Nigeria and um, I think we have a small video that we can show about his uh, wonderful poem that he did there. Um, and um, while the technicians are doing this up, I think um, it is uh, this this the change of how we are, how we work and talk with um, uh, young people, uh, rather than about young people, I think that is something that we are in the learning process in many ways. But um, that all our institutions probably uh, need to um, uh, think about um, when we um, want to have the kind of engagement that you are suggesting. And um, uh, I think this is being done much easier, perhaps at the country level, at the field level, where um, you, you are directly working with the young farmers, where you're there with the family farmers, with those who have the indigenous knowledge, indigenous solutions, and so on. Um, it is much more complicated sometimes at the um, uh, in 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 uh, at, at the regional at the national so perhaps even as well unless there is a um, ministry of youth that can facilitate. But even at the national level, it can be difficult at the at the regional at the global level. It is really difficult to to facilitate that kind of dialogue. So here, the communication on both sides perhaps needs to um, uh, adjust a bit. But what we really need to learn as in, in global institutions is um, how can we better make sure that um, uh, uh, it's understood. Uh, is the video coming? Yeah. 
and then I stopped. I'm stopping talking. Then I'm just trying to bridge here the, the video. Okay, and here much more important victory. FAO Director General, distinguished guests, and all of humankind. One planet, one plan for sustainability. To militate against hunger, pains, and humanity. The trail of human misery and degradation makes a war of starvation linger upon this generation. Not of machine guns, but intestinal sounds. Not of bullet wounds, but soft from belly pangs. Not of rubble, but stomachs rumbling. And ironical, unspoken grief with deafening silence. We lavish on war, yet the poor strive to eat. Some wasting away with malnutrition, others shockingly overweight. We are trapped in this circle of unrighteous anger, bloated out by the pangs of emptiness and perils of hunger. If this vicious circle of poverty prevails, a blooming economy will soon become stale. We are destroying our land that produces food for all, then throwing it away as if it never existed at all. If the system designed for maximum production is broken, how do we get quality over quantity of what's edible? The nitty-gritty of human survival is good nutrition, strengthened by the arms of sustainable agriculture to thrive from dawn to dusk with ecstatic satisfaction that nourishes the body with vitamins for action. So everyone should learn and earn without inferiority in pursuit of sustenance, equality, separity. What good is food availability if it is void of accessibility? What essence is it to bank on good nutrition if we've got to break a bank? The worst thing about hunger isn't just the rippling effects of war, the politics or outbreak of disease, but the silence we do not resist. So let's take the weight off our shoulders to prepare the feast that brings us together. To eliminate deficiency in a land of milk and honey is to give up exchanging resources for a penny. The earth is warming, oceans are rising, creatures must thrive and humans must keep on living. Our world is so concerned with economic numbers, yet grapples to solve the puzzle of world hunger. So let's take the weight off our shoulders to prepare the feast that brings us together by stretching forth our arms towards our mandate of what's at stake with no food going to waste. When all of heaven is filled with clouds and rain, if the universe isn't the barrel of hurricane, streaks of bliss will surely blow some on our ecosystem till the crust of drought flourishes with food system. So let's take the driver's seat on the wheel of production till earth's vegetation sprouts a diversification. If food security is our priority against instability, productivity is a recovery opportunity from calamity. One planet, one plan, here is food for thought. No more empty talk that doesn't reduce food loss. Youthful willpower is the strength of transformation, creatively propelled by inclusive contribution. Young stars should thrive innovatively in the sand of time to erect the building blocks of change for a lifetime. And if we genuinely live with a healthy diet, then we can't die yet. Thank you. Thank you, Victory. And um, with that, immediately I'm going over here to my colleagues, Anna and Leticia. And um, perhaps before we are going to this, this is an interactive part. So we really want here to start the discussion that you will ho hopefully have um, over lunch, perhaps after this session. And with that, um, if you get a little bit up out of your chairs and um, take your mobile phone away for the next three and a half minutes that we have this exercise, um, and um, perhaps also the, the the young colleagues who are um, uh, hiding behind the, the the screen here, if you can also um, uh, come in for that. I think, um, yeah, over to you guys, um, and thanks a lot. Thank you, Kasugi. Now um, that we've warmed up and have some discussion, we want to do some popcorn brainstorming. We will propose a topic, and those who raise your hands, you will have one minute. So please, we don't have that much time to try to be concise, propose concrete actions, and try to stick to one minute as much as you can. Um, the first topic we want to bring to the table is how can youth be more involved in Global Alliance for Climate Smart Agriculture and Climate Smart Agriculture in general? Someone want to start um, the conversation? Abdullah, thank you. Uh, thank you for giving me the floor, but the time is constrained, so I would stick to the point. So uh, 
youth have been given the uh, chance to represent in uh, different UN events, different events. But one thing we now need is local action. So for local action, we have to more focus on community-based projects where youth will go to their community, find out the problems. We know already the problem, climate change, but it's not that simple. It's complex uh, based on different countries, different cities. So youth will go to their community and find out the problem to solutions. So sometimes solutions can be very simple. Youth are very enthusiastic and they are, I'm pretty much sure they can bring out solutions that won't need a lot of money. So it can be, uh, we promote climate information service just uh, giving farmers a call or a SMS. So it's that simple to warn them about upcoming climatic hazard or uh, events. And there is another thing I would like to uh, propose that is establishing youth advisory committee in different activities. So I think that's very crucial to give you the uh, proper flow, not uh, acting, uh, counting us as a proper par partners in your activities. If you give them opportunity to advise you, maybe it will provide us when will the old a good future. So thank you. Thank you, Abdullah. Um, please try to stick to one minute, everyone. Um, we are now going to give the floor to Francesco. Hi, and Francesco from the World Farmers Organization. I, uh, just one single like, suggestion on our side. Uh, we must sort of uh, change the paradigm. We must, uh, instead of trying to to sort of impose the like, top-down solutions and see if they work for youth, let's go to the field. Let's go ask the youth what their needs are, the young farmers, what their needs are, what their expectations are, what do they mean by climate smart agriculture instead of imp imposing a definition which sometimes is not clear to us and uh, I guess not even like, to people working on the field. And, and let's build a definition starting like, from, from a consultation with youth and young farmers. Thank you so much. Thank you, Francesco, for that brief statement. We're now gonna give the floor to the uh, young man. I'm Rajiv, I'm Rajiv Pandey. Uh, I would just say, uh, let's make it lucrative for youth. They will come. Thank you for that brief statement. We now give the floor. Hi, my name is Allison Chothetertron. I'm from Cornell University. I would suggest or recommend strongly that we reach out to current youth agriculture organizations. In the United States, we have 4-H. It's established around the world. We also have Future Farmers of America. Also, I don't, I think it's established globally. It would be great to go to them and ask them to get involved with climate smart agriculture. Yeah. Thank you very much for that contribution. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm Mike Adidotsunoke from Nigeria. Uh, the first thing which I propose is the introduction of a good policy uh, that we have smart agriculture in each of the countries. Uh, there is a lacuna, there is a gap between the policy and the farmers, the policy orders. So they need to promote uh, a policy that will force that will forcefully allow farmers to work on smart agriculture. Then the other aspect is extension services. The extension services have to be streamlined in terms of dissemination of information of the new technology uh, in most of uh, the agricultural practices. And the farmers need to document what they are doing, a case studies whereby it can be replicated. And government can also go in to provide the enabling environment by funding the extension services so that the information can go around, the farmers can able to adopt it, then the youth can also key into agriculture. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for everyone that engaged. We love to see that you're so interesting in having this debate with us. And our final question before we all leave to lunch, so we can have a further brainstorming on the topic, it's what concrete actions can your organization, institution, government, and entity do in 
in fact, to involve youth more effectively. Anyone want to start, break the silence? It's becoming very concrete, so it's a little bit more <laughs> difficult no, than to talk. It's always, <laughs> but I see some uh, over. Yes, please. Hi, everyone. Hello, this is Julia from the World Farmers Organization. Uh, just to say that, for example, we have a capacity building program on young farmers, which is called the gymnasium, and you're going to talk about it uh, more tomorrow. Um, and for example, we are having our general assembly in a few weeks in South Africa, uh, hosted by one of our members organization, and we will have consultation uh, about climate smart agriculture as well, uh, with specific particip participation from youth, young farmers from all across the world, and we will make sure that their voices will be mainstream through our, our general assembly. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julia. Now I hand the floor over to you. Hello, don't forget there have been hands online. That is that, uh, this is from here. The oh, online audience has Vietnam. So I think um, for, uh, you know, for agriculture, so we are the, the, the next generation, we, we, we need to involve them in the agriculture activity. So as you know, the now the young generation, they don't want to work with the agriculture sectors because uh, therefore we need to encourage them to, to attend the uh, agriculture activity. So I think that we need to, to create a enabling environment for the uh, young uh, uh, people and the young farmer to involve in the agriculture activity. The first thing is very important. The second thing is that uh, we need to set up the some start sta startup program. So this program in the involves the uh, young uh, farmer, young people to 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 uh, agriculture activities, and then the, um, I think that we need to uh, conduct a capacity building program and also the um, uh, um, uh, sharing the technology and the uh, knowledge for the young people and then they can they support them to 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 do the agriculture activities so of course we need to have a policy and strategy to promote the young generation to 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 attend in the agriculture activity okay thank you thank you so much for your contribution i think we're kind of running a bit out of time no, thank you so much for um, for this. We would have liked to have much more time uh, for the uh, brainstorming exercise, but I think it shows the rich discussion about the and these, the importance as well um, of uh, youth inclusion in um, agricultural activities and, and climate smart agriculture. Um, in the end, we are talking about fifty percent. Um, well, depending on statistics um, that that are being taken, fifty percent of the world population is uh, youth. Some some are putting the age level a little bit higher, which I'm always um, in favor of. Um, but the the uh, what what we also see is that uh, if we look at the less than 18 year olds, 85% um, live in developing countries. So um, the inclusion of youth in developing countries, in particular, is a question, as, as the title suggests, um, of the future for um, for the countries. So. Um, uh, how we are systematically involving youth uh, is definitely something that um, beyond the session, I hope GAXA is going to discuss. And I'm sure with hands, uh, you will have um, these discussions for sure on the agenda. Um, uh, leaves me to um, invite you once again. Um, I hope to see all of you um, as individual uh, GAXA members, but also as uh, as a um, an, uh, an, um, a network. Uh, at the World Food Forum in um, October. And um, uh, with that, uh, Hans, I hand back over to you and also leave you your chair again. And thank you so much for having us. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, youth team, Kazuki and your team for the excellent session. It was lively. There were more requests for the one minute uh, pitch, but it shows the interest the youth has in becoming an active or being an active member of GAXA. I would invite everybody 
join the World Food Forum in October. Certainly, the Alliance will be active there. And based on the remarks made, we have to see how we can involve you more in the work of God. So thank you so much. Give them again a big applause. I think we have had an excellent morning. Uh, we're a little bit over time, but I think it's now time for to look for internal food security, to relax a little bit and come back at 2.30 sharp in this room, because then we go to the action, to the action groups with Alison, Ernie, and Rosa, Maria Rosa. I was, because she had two names. I said, uh, they will lead us into the action. Have a very good lunch. And for those who are not familiar in this building, I would say go to the eighth floor, because there you have different possibilities for lunch. And one thing is, you have the most beautiful view of Rome. And it's already an appetizer for the reception this evening. So have a very good lunch. Thank you so much. We see each other at two o'clock sharp back in this room. Thank you. 30.